All right. Good morning, everybody. Hi, good morning. I'm gonna call to order the uh, November 5th, 2019 Board of Supervisors meeting. Uh, call to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Friend. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Coonerty. Here. Uh, now I'm gonna ask you to join me in a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you're, uh, if you're able during the moment of silence, please think about all the firefighters and the folks around the state who are dealing with wildfires uh, and their impacts. Mr. Palacios, are there any late additions or changes to the, to the agenda? Uh, yes, we have two revisions. On the regular agenda, item number 16, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 399. And then on the consent agenda, item 24, there's additional materials. There's a revised attachment B, packet page 662-A. Thank you. Great. And now I'm going to ask my uh, colleagues if there's anything they'd like to remove from the consent agenda. Okay, seeing none, uh, we're now going to go on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us about items that are uh, not on today's agenda, but are within the purview of the board, uh, or are on the consent agenda, or if you're unable to stay for one of our regular agenda items because you have to get to work or childcare, uh, please feel free to speak about those items now and um, ask everyone to line up and it'll be two minutes, please. Uh, two minutes, Chair. Uh, this is Gary Richard Arnold. I want to uh, uh, congratulate the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you know, the veterans, grandfathers and fathers and uncles, their sacrifices of their lives, their arms and leaving their families alone. Congratulate the Board of Supervisors for honoring the veterans with two plaques on the courthouse steps of which uh, Major General Charles Willoughby referred to, who was uh, General Douglas MacArthur's Chief of Staff. He refers to DeLacy by name as a supporter uh, for the Nazis when they divided up Poland. So I'm, I'm sure our veterans uh, appreciate that. Uh, also on the same book of Shanghai Conspiracy he talks on page, uh, page 236, uh, the Major General uh, names Hugh DeLacy as being responsible with the number of spies for the overthrow and the takeover of communist China, uh, killing 65 million people. So I'm sure uh, the, the veterans would appreciate that. And it was General MacArthur that had to fight the Red Chinese over the Yalu Bridge, Bridge and those people that were killed during the Korean War, I'm sure the veterans would appreciate you're keeping those those plaques out there. Uh, the, the fact is, uh, you run a Soviet, you're running a parallel government. Hugh DeLacy was honored here at the uh, local uh, uh, Loud Nelson Center. Um, it is Neil Coonerty that supports Angela Davis here at his store. Uh, it is Neil Coonerty that, uh, uh, Ryan Coonerty that uh, runs a resource center who's, uh, according to their own brochure, uh, is interchangeable with the War Resisters League, which is a communist front. It is uh, uh, Ryan Coonerty that went to the school in London that created the Soviets, the Soviet that works here, which is AMBAG, uh, and in your adoption of Agenda 21, it was Khrushchev that you quoted frequently, and he says the European Union is the new Soviet, that's what you're doing here, and you don't tell the people where the real action's going on at AMBAG. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi. Hi. Honored to be here. My name is Larry Graff. I live in Live Oak. Uh, I want to talk about the new development on Capitolo Road. Uh, two, two parts. One, we'd really like a walkway to go through it. There's been a pedestrian walkway through that, that uh, land for decades, and we'd really like to be able to walk off the busy roads of Capitol and 17th and uh, be able to walk, have a walkway, a uh, pedestrian path. Also wanna speak for the trees on that property and that there's a lot of old, beautiful trees on that property. 
that have been here a lot longer than we have and like to be able to keep as many as possible on, on that property. The big trees, they're really beautiful and a lot of habitat for a lot of animals that were here before us also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I would like to speak on the same issue. Uh, I uh, believe everyone has a copy of a petition that I was able to generate walking uh, several days, uh, looking around, seeing if I can get some local folks in my neighborhood on the highway side of Capitola Road um, and also on the Harper Street side of Capitola Road to voice their opinion and sign the petition and every, lots of support for having a walk through. People are really excited about being able to walk around in their neighborhoods. Our neighborhood is becoming very impacted with housing and whatnot. And uh, there's a great need for us to be out of our cars and walking, walking to the store, walking to our favorite parks and byways. So I'm just, I'm happy to go out and do this again if need be, but I don't know what the beeping means, but oh. You have a minute left. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I must say people were really um, unaware of the project to some degree, but when um, I explained what was going on, they seemed to sort of accept the project on some level. Maybe you'll hear from others but they really liked the idea of being able to access it. They liked the idea that there might be a place for them to sit there at some point, you know, on their walk, both ways. <coughs> um, so I hope you consider that. And like I said, I'd be happy to follow up on this and, and broaden my petition if necessary, but I thought just getting people in that specific area should be a good indicator of public sentiment, so. Please consider this action. Thank what, you. Uh, uh, what kind of trees are, were we talking about? They're mostly oak trees. Oak, oak, okay. They're fantastic if you haven't had a chance to see them. And then if you stay there for a few minutes, you'll notice all kinds of animal activity, bird life and so. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having us here. My name is Maria Cadenas. I'm the executive director of Santa Cruz Community Ventures, and I'm here to speak on behalf and in support of the consent item number 32, which is the creation of Santa Cruz seats. Um, at Ventures, we focus on creating equitable and compassionate economies here in Santa Cruz County and the Monterey Bay region. And we are very cognizant of the importance of the education and future of our children. Santa Cruz seats is following national best standards to make sure that our children can succeed and have a college education or vocational post-secondary education. The program is really one that's being highlighted across the state. In fact, I'm presenting next week at the California Affordability College Conference to present the model that we created here in Santa Cruz. We should be very proud of the investment that we're doing with our children. Children with savings accounts are three times more likely to go to college, four times more likely to graduate, regardless of the amount in the account. Furthermore, these accounts decrease maternal uh, postpartum depression and increase the social emotional well-being of the child again regardless of what amount is in the account this is about creating hope and making sure that kids have pathways for economic mobility in the future and that is the future of our county so thank you again for considering this and putting this in the consent agenda and again from Santa Cruz Community Ventures we're very grateful for the commitment to the future of our county thank you thank you Uh, hi, my name is Shalak Kabanis and I love Santa Cruz. Hi, I'm Erica Miranda Bartlett and I'm a, the co-chair of the Mental Health Advisory Board. Shalak is the chair. And I wanna uh, bring up a couple things. I wanna thank you for your appointment of Dr. Joanna Whitcup to the board. We are currently working on the biannual report due at the end of this year. And in written correspondence, we have just submitted the 2000, 2019 data notebook for Santa Cruz County. And we've also submitted it to the California Behavioral Health Planning Council, which was due at the end of this month. Uh, we received tremendous help from Dr. Lisa Gutierrez Wang, the Director of Children's Behavioral Health, and from Jane Boons uh, Kurtzva, our administrative aide. 
the data notebook reviews information and reports on the county's behavioral health services with the goals of reviewing performance, educational resources, to get opinions and thoughts on specific topics and to identify unmet needs. This year's focus was on trauma-informed principles, specifically re regarding childhood. A good portion, a good portion is educational, covering trauma, trauma-informed care, adverse childhood experience survey known as ACE, resiliency, and some examples of evidence-based practices like first five. Highlights, uh, the county behavioral health under the leadership of Director Eric Rivera uh, works across departments and community organizations to help expand supportive housing like Union Street and Maple Street in Watsonville. The county behavioral health is committed to becoming a trauma-informed system also working across districts with community partners, the County Office of Education, under the leadership of Superintendent Fair Sabat, has a strategic plan that includes a system of care that addresses both behavioral health, substance use, and suicide. And areas that we're seeing for improvement, we would like to see more support of trauma-informed practices in the jails, criminal justice systems, skilled nursing facilities, and independent board care. Done in five seconds left. <laughs> thank All you right. so much. Thank you guys so much. Hey, thank I, you. I wanna thank you both. Wow. Uh, I want to thank you both for all the work, hard work you're doing. Thank you very much. And there were two of you. We should, we could have given you a few more seconds. <laughs> we anyway, appreciate your thanks hard work a lot. <laughs> thank you. Hi, my name is Vanessa Young. I'm a resident here in Pleasure Point. Um, I'm here today to ask you guys to consider adding more resources to the planning department. Uh, my husband and I recently bought a house in Pleasure Point. We scraped together everything we could to get a pretty broken house. It's got a cracked foundation, a leaking roof, and t yesterday marked the one year mark that we've been working with the planning department to try to repair our roof. So we're about to go through another rainy season with buckets in our living room because the planning department can't do anything in less than 12 weeks. So with two submissions at 12 weeks, that's 24 weeks plus the architect's time to turn around drawings. It's pretty unacceptable that I've got a million dollar house that can't hold any insulation, no heat. And six months ago I had a newborn, so looks like this winter we're not even going to be able to live there because the house is too cold. And once it starts to rain, our roof is leaking. So I'm here today to ask you to consider adding staff or making changes to the planning department so that people like us who wanna stay residents, who scrape it together to buy a house, can actually have a livable house, which right now our house is through the winter not going to be livable. It's been quite frustrating. I think with some resources, you could make a huge difference to the community. Thank you. That's my ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Nice seeing you. Uh, Michael Saint, uh, citizen of Santa Cruz County. Uh, I'm here mainly because I'm concerned uh, for climate change as well as the crisis that that presents to all of us. Uh, one question for all you um, supervisors. When considering all these projects that come in front of you, um, do you personally use the size of its carbon footprint or ask the question, how can we mitigate the size of this carbon footprint? Uh, before we approve the, the actual project. As you probably know, on January 1st, uh, 2020, California has a new solar mandate for new uh, solar on all new housing projects, condos and apartments up to three stories. Um, this also encourages more electric use versus gas use, uh, which happens uh, to reduce natural gas consumption, also reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Mr. McPherson with Monterey uh, Bay Community Power will get a chance to vote uh, in December on their electrification plans for 1920 and also five years into the future. They're trying to get contractors to actually stop running natural gas lines and go full electric on their homes. I'm wondering if this has been considered in the Live Oak project. Um, I hope you all feel as I do that it's time to join the 21st century and drastically lower our carbon footprint when these projects come in front of you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gage Dayton and I'm a resident of Live Oak Community and I wanna echo my support for the two Live Oak Community members who want more open space and public access space at the development on Capitola and I'm here to speak to that item as well. 
Um, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm a longtime Live Oak resident and I greatly appreciate Supervisor Leopold's effort to engage our community on that project on Capitola. Um, our community came out in great numbers, multiple meetings, there was a lot of written comment as well. We had, to say, we had a lot to say about the future of this unique property, and it is a unique property for our community that we only have one opportunity to give insight into um, for our future. Uh, I also agree that there is a real need and a, and a deep need for affordable housing um, and the two services that will be located at that site. However, I feel strongly that the planning process was flawed and that it included the adjacent parcel where the laundry mat and live oak supermarket is in the community planning process. So the, our community gave input on those two parcels where in fact that parcel it wasn't entitled and is not part of the, the project going forward. Um, if you look at the significant community input, the current project does not appear uh, to reflect the community consensus on what we wanted in, in that parcel. Again, because we were, we were speaking to two parcels and there's only one parcel now being developed. Um, it lacks open space, as was mentioned earlier. Um, it lacks a significant mixed use and it lacks a community area. All points that I feel were voiced in the community planning process. Uh, I request that you reject the plan and re-engage our community to discuss a project that only includes that parcel um, uh, so that we can have a voice in shaping our community. It is a one-time opportunity for us and a little bit more time to get it right, I think is warranted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanna uh, make clear for folks, so that item is gonna be, uh, gonna be heard at 10.30 and you're, we're happy to have you talk now if you can't stay, but uh, the folks who wanna speak to that item when it comes up, will be hearing it at 10.30. And I'll be gone. That's oh, perfect, well, I'm glad you utilized this opportunity. Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, supervisors. Um, my name is o Owen Thomas. I'm a resident in Santa Cruz. Um, I'm speaking in regards to item 14 um, on the agenda. So I'm in support of passing um, provisions that mirror AB 1482 the um, um, sort of uh, tenant protections and um, limited rent cap that has been passed by the state of California that's gonna, be, that's gonna go in effect in January. Um, I'm in support of passing an ordinance that implements those provisions early in order to cover the gap in between now and January so that there isn't a um, possibility of tenants slipping through the cracks of those provisions during this sort of period. Um, I have heard of mass evictions happening in Capitola. I've also been supportive of tenants who are getting evicted um, in the lower ocean area of Santa Cruz. So I know that um, evictions are happening that otherwise wouldn't be happening if the um, ordinance were in effect. Um, so yeah, as someone who's against displacement and for keeping um, low income tenants in our community, um, I'm very supportive of some sort of urgent um, protections being implemented now as opposed to later in January. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. I have the um, hotline for tenants for the last five and a half years. I run that for free and um, don't throw money and no, no applause. And um, <clears throat> I've been, uh, I've gotten well over, you know, probably around 2,000 phone calls in the last few years to have records of. And a lot, most of them are from the county, of course, because in this county, there's more population in the county than in four cities put together, unlike any other county, as I understand it. So I've been getting a lot of phone calls in the past month or two uh, from people who are long-term renters getting kicked out <clears throat> for no good reason. And I understand that you don't support just cause eviction or you would have passed it, but this is about the time to pass it. I think you'll find your streets have fewer people living on them. Last night I got a call from a Mexican man who's been living in Watsonville for a long time, who's now homeless. Now you have Mexican and Mexican American homeless people. You had many fewer before. Good morning. My name is Virginia Buena. And I have a sandwich, and I'm a single parent. I'm older, 60 plus, 
and my son is disabled, very seriously is disabled. I got, just I got the notice for being evicted from the apartment I have been living in, um, in the building in uh, this apartment for 13 years because the owner of the building just changed, I mean, transferred from the deceased owner to the siblings. And um, I just wanna let you know, uh, they are very cold hearted and they don't even care. I got a um, section eight voucher, which is not useful at all because it's giving them power, the owner's power to accept it or not. And then being low income and having a son which is disabled, I'm responsible for his future and life. I don't have any other choices. And starting with November, 20th, I have to live in the street. So what would you do or what you're gonna do to help us like a vulnerable, vulnerable people we are in these situations? So that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, a resident of rural Aptos. And I just want to protest again, public comment has been reduced again to two minutes and we do not have the ability to pull any consent agenda items. Were there any consent agenda items pulled this morning by supervisors? No. Thank you. I did request that one be pulled, number 44. So I would like to speak to that, number 44, that is the uh, uh, county's uh, list of projects being submitted for RSTPX funding from the Resource uh, Regional Transportation Commission. These are pretty much a, a given that they will be funded, perhaps not at the level that is requested, but they are always funded. And I wanna protest in District 2, again, for the third year, the uh, request from the county for funding of a traffic light in Aptos Village that is a traffic mitigation for the Aptos Village project, pure and simple. This would uh, give $400,000 to the traffic light at Aptos Creek Road. That is a traffic mitigation for phase two of the development. And this is a pure gift to Swenson developer and I protested. When there are roads such as Eureka Canyon Highland that are in shambles, um, we don't need to gift public money to Barry Swenson. I also wanna say that uh, there is no uh, project for Lompico Road in this list. I have given you information that Lompico has been designated as the number one Bay Area riskiest evacuation for fires and that's not even on this list. So, um, that needs to be looked at and I hope you will. I want to also say that um, in short time, the CSA 48 ballot measures are coming out in the mail this week. They were printed in Sacramento. They were not even printed locally for local business people. And I protest that there is no Proposition 172 money even being considered or Measure G sales tax that was sold to the people for fire that will go to support county fire. Thank you. Hi there, uh, my name is Raphael. Uh, I wanted to bring your attention to uh, item number 24 in your cons consent agenda, uh, which is a resolution adopting uh, $1.6 million in uh, uh, homeless emergency aid program funding for the uh, Salvation Army uh, uh, 1220 River Street uh, program and the Laurel Street program. Uh, I just wanted to let you know in case you aren't aware, that uh, most of this funding is for a program that has already existed since, Jan or since uh, uh, July. And uh, this is just approving the uh, funding uh, specifically for uh, Laurel Street until June and for the 1220 River Street tent program until the end of, of March when, the, uh, when that facility will close for a city maintenance project. Um, this is concerning because there isn't currently a funding plan for the uh, the three months after uh, after that uh, the closing of that project. Uh, the uh, the agenda item mentions that uh, staff may come back to you uh, with uh, requests for additional funding, um, and I hope that 
if and when they do that, that you would approve such funding um, because uh, there's currently uh, over a hundred thousand dollar gap in uh, the funding available uh, from the heap program or from the heap emergency aid funding and the cash funding to uh, uh, to pay for that that program. So uh, the 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 county and the city are going to have to step up and uh, and figure out a way to fund that. Otherwise, we're going to have uh, the sixty people. Help, 60 plus people in that shelter back on the streets again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Monica McGuire. I live in Coralitos. I'm coming again very late because of the traffic problems that for whatever unknown reasons, the Greenway proposals have not been heard and understood by the five of you well enough or the county administrators or anyone else in order to free up the traffic in the known way in hundreds of counties across this country, having bike lanes, having the train tracks turned into a thoroughfare is by far the best way to get the traffic lightened and making more sense. I also want to again call attention to the sad, sad state of affairs that you have so many of us coming regularly to ask you to accept our help since you are clearly so overworked that you can't get everything done. We understand it's a hard job and we really and truly, so many of us in this county are wishing you would accept our volunteerism, our help, our care, our requests that you would have evening meetings so that more people could come to show you what the people of this county want to do for ourselves and to help you with your jobs have apparently been on deaf ears. But I will repeat, that is a way to get the 90% of people I've been talking to for the last few months asking throughout this county, at least a thousand people, do you know who your county supervisor is? <coughs> and 90% don't know who their county supervisor is. No idea whatsoever. Of the 10% that say they know, it is rare if half a percent has actually attended a meeting of that hundred, I mean. You are in this terrible position where people have no idea what you're doing or why, and they're cynical. They believe there's no point in coming because they think things are corrupt. I don't believe that. I believe you're doing the best you can. I believe all humans are doing the best they can. Thank you. But you need help. And we ask that you start in inviting us to come and help you and taking our offers better. Thank you. Thank you. The offer. Please accept this time. Thank you, your time's up. I'm so sorry that's the case again. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Vasky, and I'd like to thank the board for um, adding item 14, emergency renter protections, and in particular, my supervisor, Coonerty, for being very responsive to my emails on this. I've been in Santa Cruz my entire adult life. Most of that has been as a renter. Um, and because I've been a renter, that means that I've been uh, renting in most of your districts, not necessarily by choice, but because I have to move quite frequently. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. And AB 1482 is the state saying that uh, we will now have better ways for renters to have security in their housing. Um, and it's going to be coming whether uh, people want it or not. And we finally have um, a chance to, um, to help all these people with this. But there is this loophole for two months that people are using, unfortunately, to evict people from their homes. Um, good landlords will not be affected by emergency protections. And short-term measures like these can have great, um, great effect for good in our county. Um, cities all over the state, from Los Angeles to Redwood City, um, last night San Mateo as well, um, have passed these emergency protections. Um, you can be the first county to, to pass emergency protections like all the cities are doing around the state. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, County Supervisors. My name is Antonio Rivas. And I would like to have the opportunity to really thank you, all of you, 
and in a way that uh, now we're going to have a mental health facility in the city of Watsonville. And that's something that is very important to the, to the needs of our, our community in the city of Watsonville. And also I would like to just to uh, continue to, to make sure that we continue to provide those services into the city and throughout the San Diego County because I think it's a big need in the mental health, uh, including uh, seniors, including young adults, and including children. So with that in mind, I, will, I wish uh, we continue to do this, and I thank you all of you for, for doing this to our city of Watsonville. Thank you. Thanks, Antonio. Marilyn Garrett, uh, I want to give some references right away about wireless microwave dangers. Take back your power.net. Yeah, we really need that. Uh, search online, Dr. Magda Havas, YouTube videos on radiation exposure. And the third one, Dr. Barry Trower. Could you hold the picture, Monica? Thing? Okay, last night, <clears throat> excuse me. I went to see the film Harriet about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad during the days of slavery and the whole abolitionist movement. And it was uh, very inspiring and disturbing. In the film, you can, we can understand about slavery and the visual br brutality. And I was thinking of modern day forms of slavery. Wage slavery, you could give a list. I also think of the telecom industry with their invisible continuous assault with microwaves and harm on us and toxic trespass. Harriet Tubman insisted she would leave slave, slaves to freedom even when told she couldn't. She was determined to do what was needed and what was right. I think of you, Board of Supervisors, saying our hands are tied when it comes to putting radiation emitting cell towers everywhere, harming people, devaluing property. Our hands are tied. I urge you to break the change of the telecom industry, what I feel is a toxic military occupation, with the most recent example being the Seventh Day Adventist campsite approved. Um, Thank you, Marilyn. And I urge you to contact Renette Senum of the Nevada City Council opposing this and sign on to the Stop 5G on Earth and in Space appeal. Thanks, Marilyn. I will give that to you again. And uh, Marilyn, your two minute coonerty. Thank we you. used to have three minutes, sir. Thank you. Are there any other, is there anyone else who'd like to speak to us today? All right, seeing none, uh, we'll now move on to our regular agenda. First, we'll start off with item number seven. This, oh, sorry, we need to, yes, we do. Yes, action on the consent agenda. Uh, so uh, first, we're gonna go to item number six, which is action on the consent agenda. These are items 18 to 45. Uh, I'll first ask my colleagues if they have any comments they'd like to make. Um, Supervisor Caput. I'll just make a uh, comment. Uh, it, it, someone requested uh, item, I think, believe 44, and 44. Uh, I'm I'm happy to see that money's going to go towards uh, Hulahan and the College Road intersection in District Four, and also some of the money in District Two that's going to Par uh, Pioneer and Varney Road. Uh, which is just right across the street from my uh, my district. So I'm not going to pull the item. Uh, this is uh, $4.8 million uh, that is for the RSTP share. Uh, it's not all the money that's going to go to only these projects. Uh, other maintenance will be taking place uh, while... <laughs> while this money is being uh, looked at right now. These are just, it's a list of priorities. And uh, I think it's a fair list. Uh, there is other money for other projects, but this is uh, 4.8 million that uh, 
I believe is uh, equitably uh, uh, portioned out to the county. So th thanks for the comment, but I'm not gonna pull it. I just wanted to explain my position. Thank you. Okay, yeah, Supervisor uh, McPherson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, there's a, a several items of three or four that I wanted to talk about. Uh, item 24, um, I wanna thank again the Homeless Service Coordination Office uh, for providing, the, and the Salvation Army, we're working with the Salvation Army for providing this uh, needed sheltering for the community. And a bank, big thank you to the Salvation Army that has done this f in coordination with the, uh, the city and the county. Uh, this really represents the most uh, comprehensive emergency sheltering uh, program we have and that uh, we've been able to provide in Santa Cruz County to date. And uh, quite often uh, homelessness uh, comes to our questions about it, come to our office that we're not doing enough to address the homeless situation. And uh, you're probably right on the face of it, but I think we're doing a lot with what we have. And that's why I'd like, I think it deserves some explanation. Uh, we are budgeted to spend $14 million this year between our sources that we get funds from, which includes offering half of the overall HAP jurisdictions funding related to this contract with the Salvation Army. And to give folks a sense of how much this costs for, to provide emergency sheltering, the cost per bed at Laurel Street per night is $62. The cost per tent at the River Street shelter is $42 per night. This is to keep folks off the street, which we're doing, and we want to continue to do that and expand on it. But there are no day services or navigation facilities either. And I think it's important for the community to understand it is going to be expensive to add housing navigation on top of the emergency sheltering that we have. It's going to be so important that we make the right investments of what we can do with what we have um, and the funding of the North County Navigation Center because that will involve a much larger funding mechanism than we have now. Um, but I do have a question about, um, and I think Randy Marr might be able to answer this. Uh, what is, uh, it was referred to uh, by one of the community members, um, what is the plan for replacing the uh, 1220 River Street shelter when it goes offline in March at this point? Do we have a plan of attack? Good morning, yes. Um, Rainey Perez, County Homeless Services Coordinator. And the there is work underway. Uh, city and county are working together to identify an alternative location. Where it's anticipated that the River Street site will probably not be available due to a water project planned there. And so a site is being identified and we anticipate that we will be able to move people. Okay, and I want to explain that the, the city has a long plan uh, uh, um, to, to put a water facility to uh, help the water system in the city of Santa Cruz to put a place it there. It's been on their planning board for yes. a long time. And so yes. this is not something that just came up and we're saying, hey, you're out of here. That's true. And in fact, uh, w the project was delayed due to permitting. So the fact that we're able to use it right now is somewhat of a blessing because we did not think it would be available. So they, if the project is not ready to be worked on by May 31st, then we may be able to, ex or sorry, March 31st, we may be able to extend, but we don't, we won't know that yet. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and I, I wanted to thank um, on item number uh, 33, Christine Burge for, uh, from our clerk of the board um, for applying uh, to the uh, Substance, uh, uh, Substance uh, Use Disorder Services Commission. Um, I wanna thank my county uh, colleagues here on the board for um, reappointing me to, as the uh, California State Association of Counties uh, representative. Uh, CSAC, as it's referred to, is invaluable resources and accord, getting a coordinated effort from counties throughout California, so especially in issues like the, the terrible fires that we've been experiencing and how we can coordinate our efforts to make things as decent as possible we can for some really tough situations. Um, but uh, they, CSAC has got a great team of people up there for us, and I appreciate that very much. Um, on item 37, the mental health diversion funding, I'm, I'm glad we're getting these funds uh, as we reference to, to place uh, those experiencing mental health uh, disorders in an appropriate setting before trial. Um, but I just wanted to find out a little more about that without pulling it from the consent item. What are the options for placing these folks in a secure manner? Um, does anybody, can anybody answer that for me? Uh, 
And uh, you know, how is public safety being taken into account on this? Good morning, Supervisor McPherson, Mimi Hall with the Health Services Agency. I have Pam Rogers Wyman here as well. She's our Adult Behavioral Health Services Director. Um, first of all, to be eligible for diversion, you have to meet certain criteria. There are three specific diagnoses and it's only those three that make you eligible. Second of all, your mental illness has got to be connected with the crime that you're being charged with. And then third of all, you have to be amenable to treatment. So um, there's no one magic bullet answer as they go to a certain place. It's based on the assessment of um, the individual. So. We have a number of local options and facilities. Um, the idea is to not have someone languish in jail before they go off to the state hospital. So it could be that they're um, deemed 5150 and they'll be put on a hold or they'll go to a crisis. Uh, psychiatric crisis facility. It could be that they're deemed um, to be conserved. It could be that they have, um, they go to a locked residential. It really depends on what the individual is assessed with. And I don't know if Pam wants to add anything more. Um, thank you. Um, the, uh, the purpose of this particular statute, the law that passed was to get people with serious mental illnesses out of jail and into treatment um, in a more expedited manner. Right now they're languishing in our jail anywhere between three, four and five months awaiting a state hospital bed. So the population that's been carved out for this um, this particular program are actually nonviolent offenders, first of all. Um, they have to pose, not pose a risk to the community to be served in the community. And the community really means, as Mimi described, based on their uh, mental health needs. If someone needs to be on an inpatient unit, that would be the level of care that we would pr be providing. Um, if they are really amenable to services, they start taking medication in the jail, they could be released potentially to our subacute facility. So the grant was specific for staff, not a facility, to wrap services around the individuals, inclusive of pretrial services. So people being released from the jail, if they're going to an open, unlocked setting, would be placed on pretrial potentially with an ankle monitor, depending on the individual, um, and they have regular reviews before the court. Um, if these individuals um, are compliant and they move through their treatment, um, they go back to court, the charges potentially can be diverted. If they're non-compliant, they're remanded to custody. Okay, I, I really appreciate the further explanation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think it's very much needed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple items to comment on on, on the uh, item number uh, 24. I want to appreciate all the folks who are working on addressing homeless uh, care in our community. Uh, this is a good partnership with the City of Santa Cruz, uh, with the Salvation Army, um, and uh, with other organizations. And I appreciate the work that we're doing at both ends of the county. Uh, and uh, the efforts we're trying to do to meet immediate needs uh, and continue to work on the long-term uh, strategies. Uh, on item number 37, which we just talked about, it, it, one thing that uh, the people may not be aware is that the, the largest provider in this country of mental health services are county jails. And uh, it's not an appropriate place for it. Uh, we ask a lot of uh, our county jail uh, to, to now to also be a mental health provider. So I really appreciate the work on staff to secure these funds and find other ways to be able to, uh, to uh, hold people accountable, but ha have them treated in the most appropriate location rather than behind bars, uh, because that, that hopefully that will be a better outcome for the individual and for the community as a whole. And I just appreciate the ongoing work that our staff has to do every day in, uh, in providing care inside of our jail. On item number 38, uh, I want to appreciate the uh, Parks Department uh, for their work in securing a second grant for the Soco Creek Linear Parkway project. This is going to be a very exciting uh, part of the heart of Soquel, where we'll be able to walk along the creek um, uh, behind Soquel Elementary and connect with Lyons uh, Park Bridge. Uh, I'm really excited to see this moving forward, and I appreciate the efforts that have gone into it. Uh, lastly, on item number 44, uh, the RSTPX funds. This was a, a, a call from our 
Public Works Director, Matt Machado, to think about these uh, fundings differently from uh, the RTC. Uh, I'm glad to see the work being uh, done in the first district. It will make a big difference, especially on North Rodeo Gulch Road. And I wanna appreciate the work of the staff to make that happen. That's it. Supervisor Friend. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to, to build on what Supervisor Leopold just said, if it weren't for uh, the Public Works staff, including Director Machado, we wouldn't have been aware of the possibility of being able to do this formula base as so many other communities do. Uh, this board actually voted unanimously at the Regional Transportation Commission to move toward that format, even though there was a significant amount of discussion uh, regarding it. As a result of it, it's opened up a lot of new funding uh, for specific types of roads, arterial roads within the community. And in my district, as Supervisor Caput noted, it, it opens up funding, uh, much needed funding for Coralitas that hadn't been available before. So I appreciate the work of us, of uh, Director Machado, but also of this board for uh, taking that position at the Regional Transportation Commission to make this funding available. Great. Um, and I just have a couple additional directions and a couple comments. So first on item number 24, this is the Shelter and Salvation Army contract. I really wanna appreciate the uh, staff's work in uh, providing year round shelter. And I know it's, um, it's a challenging and uh, process and we're gonna be looking at having to address the, the River Street camp. Um, and, I, and I look forward to the solutions that are brought forward. I do have some additional directions because uh, we wanna make sure that when we provide these services, they also don't uh, uh, unduly impact the community. So the added direction I would add is First, that we direct staff to develop a written plan with the city and the provider to reduce impacts or relocate the current drop-off site at Laurel and Front Street, and staff should provide a memo to the board by November 18th on that. I'd also, uh, the second direction would be direct staff and HSD staff to actively assist any shelter uh, clients with minor children within two days of the family becoming a shelter client. We really want to prioritize children so that they don't um, experience any more uh, unnecessary trauma um, <clears throat> than they're already um, than they're already going through by uh, experiencing homelessness. And the third one is direct staff to provide a memo to the board uh, quarterly reports the number of clients who are utilizing our homeward bound program. We've c come up with resources for the Salvation Army to provide. Um, bus tickets and other, uh, and other resources to people who can return to communities where they will have a better support system. Um, and we should get just quarterly reports to see how that's going. Um, on item number 32, the children's savings account, I wanna uh, appreciate Maria uh, and Community Ventures for bringing this to the board. I think this is a really exciting opportunity to provide uh, savings accounts to families, uh, babies, uh, and their families in our community and the impacts that she cited we see around the country are really um, remarkable in terms of uh, giving people a sense of a future and a possibility and hope uh, and that the community is investing in them and their future. And so I'm, I'm proud to be working with Maria on that. Um, on item number 37, uh, I, I think that it's, it's a really important program and for all the reasons that have been stated over, uh, uh, stated, but I also wanna make sure we implement this correctly. So the added direction that I would um, add uh, is that before a new mental health uh, non-locked modality is open or utilized, there'll be a community meeting organized by county HSA staff, notice to residents in a thousand foot radius of the proposed location. In addition, this new non-locked modality will receive a majority approval from the city council or the board of supervisors in the jurisdiction where it's to be located. Um, I think there's existing facilities and we can also work on locked facilities, but if we're gonna be creating uh, new uh, locations, it's really important that we engage the community before, uh, before that happens. Um, and on item number 42, the Davenport Crossing, um, there's a really, this is a dire need to create safety uh, in our community. Uh, and uh, this is a very dangerous location where we have people crossing the highway, oftentimes visitors who don't uh, know that they're crossing a state highway as they move back and forth between Davenport and the beach. Um, and so I really wanna make sure that we're moving forward uh, on creating a safe crossing as soon as possible. I, I would just want a clarity on the, sure. on the question uh, of notification. Um, 
because I, I agree that we need to have good notification. We have to include uh, people in discussion. Uh, it, it's just a big thing to add as part of a, a consent item. And so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Sure, I, I mean, I think um, to the extent we have existing facilities, uh, those are existing and uh, hopefully well managed. To the extent we have lock facilities, those, those address the concerns. But the extent that we're gonna be adding any new non-locked modalities, I think, um, for uh, for this particular population, I think there should be outreach and approval by the by the appropriate jurisdiction. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm this this is a big item. I I, uh, I feel uncomfortable voting for it without understanding what that means, and so I'm I'm wondering if we could either uh, uh, continue it to the next meeting so I have a chance to find out a little bit more about it. I, I may be in support of it, but it, it, the idea of turning over land use authority or something to someone else, I just think I wanna contemplate what that exactly means. Um, uh, and, I, and if it can wait until, uh, until sure. our next meeting. Well, so I'm not at the next meeting, so this would be moved to the December meeting, uh, which I don't know if that impacts the grant or, uh, or acceptance. We have somebody from HSA. Um, so the impact on the grant is of course, until we accept the funds, we won't be able to hire into the positions or start. Um, as it is right now, we have the state scheduled to come this month uh, to work on our performance outcomes. Um, I would have to delay them, obviously, if we can't start the program. I'm also wondering, Pam, if you could clarify, I don't think that the additional um, motion that you would like to bring back has an impact on us making good on the grant. It's not right, we are not opening a facility. The funding is specific for positions using existing resources that we already have in the community. So there'll be no new modalities. It's hard to understand what, there what will, the impact could be. It'd be all existing we are utilizing existing um, behavioral health programs that we have in the community. Some of them are locked, some of them are unlocked. The funding is specific for staffing, very intensive staffing, case management, a one to five, a one to 10 kind of ratio um, to follow people through their care in the community as well as the pretrial services. So there are no facilities attached to this funding any new facilities attached the to the facilities, funding. but but this could be, this is a new population in. Truthfully, this is our same population. You know, sometimes it's a little bit of a decision tree for law enforcement in the field to determine whether or not they're writing a 5150 on an individual and taking them to our crisis stabilization program, or they're gonna press a charge and take them to jail. Um, and so it's really for those people in the gray area that this program is determined for. It's really for people that are amenable to treatment. So, I mean, I, I understand it. I can't support adding this, a new population into um, that that is, has committed a felony into a neighborhood uh, without somehow notifying uh, them if it's going to be an unlocked facility. So um, we can delay, uh, or we can, if the rest of the board wants to vote, they can vote. But. Um, I'm uncomfortable with adding an, a, a new condition on citing facilities that are hard to cite unless we have some kind of reasonable discussion about it. It's, I, I understand right. the concern. Yeah. I just, I, I just think as a consent item addition, it, it's, it's a little, it's a little much to take on. Yeah. Uh, and so I feel comfortable voting for this grant. I feel, um, uh, in listening to the staff, the idea that. Um, that they aren't, there isn't gonna be any new facilities that are part of this, um, and that these are people who are currently in our system, and we're finding a better way to treat them rather than just having the jail treat them, uh, seems like a reasonable piece. And I would welcome, uh, uh, an, if you wanna bring an item to the board so we can have a discussion about this and be prepared, I, I, I would look forward to that, but I, I just feel comfortable, uncomfortable um, adding that as an amendment. Yeah. Do we have a motion? That's a motion. We're talking about 37. 
what I would, I would move the consent agenda as, uh, as included here with no additional. Will you include the additional direction on the Salvation Army contract? Uh, remind me what that is. That's uh, to develop, the staff should develop a written plan with the city to reduce impacts on the current drop-off site uh, or, or change the drop-off site and provide a memo to the board, direct HSA and HSC staff to actively exist in these shelter clients with minor children within two days of them becoming a, sh uh, a, a shelter client and direct the staff to provide a memo of the, to the board a quarterly reports on the number of clients who utilize homeward bound. It's a lot there, but I would, ex uh, I, I will take that okay. as is amendment. I'll second. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So we have um, a motion and a second uh, on um, the, the, the consent agenda with the added direction on item number 24. Uh, I'll be voting no on item 37, um, but all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And, uh, all passed unanimously with me voting no on item number 37. Um, all right, moving on to item number uh, seven, which is a presentation honoring Susan Rosario on her retirement as outlined in a memorandum by me. And we have the Sheriff Jim Hart here to, to make a presentation and Zach Friend. Well, good morning, board. Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner, and with me is Susan Rosario, <clears throat> who's been a longtime county employee uh, and has worked for the sheriff's office uh, as well as the the board for many, many years. And it's been my honor and privilege to have worked with you for all this time, Susan. And she has brought in literally millions of dollars to the county and the sheriff's office to support. Uh, our jails to support our patrol teams, our investigations units, our forensics teams, our coroner's unit. And when somebody like this steps out the door, when it's her time to leave, uh, it's a bittersweet moment for me because uh, I'm happy that she's retiring but I'm, uh, and, and gonna enjoy time with her family, but she leaves a tremendous void at the sheriff's office. And so we have some, some big shoes to fill, Susan, uh, but I wish you a, a happy and healthy retirement. I wanna thank you for all your years of service. I wanted to thank all the board members and the wonderful county employees that I've had the privilege to work with over my 35 years at the county. I want to thank Kathy Sams for uh, drafting the proclamation since that's usually my assignment. <laughs> I'm very proud of everything that has been accomplished by county government during my tenure. And I know that great many things will be accomplished in the future. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, we we do have a proclamation here and I wanted to read a couple elements of it because it speaks to some of the remarkable work that Susan has done. I've had the privilege of working with Susan both in my previous capacity with Santa Cruz Police and now here. But in your 35 years, what I think something that some of the board members may not realize is that Susan spent the first 16 of her years, the career uh, with the clerk of the board's office before she ended up at the sheriff's office. And it says that she had supported 13 different members of the board of supervisors, including two in the first district, two in the second district, two in the third district, four in the fourth, Greg. That's a lot of, <laughs> lot of turnover going on over there. And three in the fifth, as well as two different CAOs during uh, that time, obviously doing a remarkable amount of work with the sheriff's office. But she has written over 1,500 board letters on behalf of the sheriff, written hundreds of grants, uh, including COPS grants, reentry grants, the JAG grants, Homeland Security grants, just to name a few, bringing in literally tens of millions of dollars to this county <laughs> for your work. Uh, so this is after 35 years, you are not a replaceable person and you should be acknowledged for the work you did, not just for the Board of Supervisors, but for the tens of millions of dollars you brought in for this county to make it a safer place and a better place to live. Uh, this is a proclamation signed by every board member, which as you know, is a very rare occurrence. And as a result, uh, it would require a motion. And so I would uh, move to adopt this proclamation. Second. Thank you. And uh, so we have a motion and a second and a lot of gratitude for your, you. for your work for this community. Um, My pleasure. It's, it's great public service. So what do, you, uh, uh, what do you plan on doing for the, <laughs> the, maybe the first year or two of retirement? I'm hoping to travel and not have to get up at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. 
you made the move from the, the county board to the sheriff's office. Um, I don't know if that was a good move or not, but boy, uh, he, I know he appreciated it and so did the sheriffs. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it was um, just thorough and everything you did all the time, uh, much appreciated. Um, boy, uh, we have so many employees uh, like you, but you're a star of the show. So thank you very much for everything you've done. Uh, and Susan, I want to uh, appreciate your work. You know, uh, going from the Board of Supervisors to the Sheriff's Office is kind of like the frying pan into the fire. Uh, and uh, in the years that you've worked here, you've seen a lot of changes. You probably started on those 1,500 board letters on a typewriter. Um, exactly. That uh, th uh, there was probably a mimeograph paper in there uh, along the way. Um, and now uh, to be working in a uh, uh, a uh, state-of-the-art facility that we have for the Center for Public Safety. Uh, it just shows that we've come a long way in the years that you've been here. And in part because of your service and the efforts that you've put in, we've been able to grow and meet the needs of our community. And um, it, you're one of the, the uh, a key part of uh, our county family that has helped us grow over time. So thank you and great uh, best of luck uh, in your retirement. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously and thank you for your service. Now we're going to consider final appointment of Josette uh, Ergang to the In-Home Supportive Services Advisory Commission as an at-large uh, consumer representative for a term to expire April 1st, 2021. I uh, move the appointment. And a motion by, by Leopold, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. We're now gonna move on to item number nine, which is consider amending the Santa Cruz County Code to add chapter 5.47 uh, regarding a charge on single use disposable cups at businesses in the unincorporated area. Consider proposing a notice of exemption from CEQA. Schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on November 9th, 2019, and direct public works to conduct outreach and education to local businesses as outlined in a memorandum of the deputy CA. <laughs> Director of Public Works. Mr. Gontroff. Good morning. Tim Gontroff with Public Works, and with me is Casey Colossa, the manager of recycling and solid waste services. I, I wanted to start with just a bit of brief background. We began this process in February when the board asked us to study issues of litter and pollution and make recommendations for policy updates to address that. We came back on August 6th to share a number of options and the board directed us to pursue two of these. The first is to prohibit the use of plastic water bottles at county facilities. And the second was to <coughs> submit an ordinance requiring county businesses to charge for single use disposable cups. The prohibition on plastic water bottles at county facilities does not require a new ordinance. This will be included in the annual county policy updates that will be brought back to the board in December. So you'll have an opportunity to consider that then. <coughs> so moving on to the ordinance on single use cups. Our research was guided by three related factors. Back in 2011, the board passed a single-use bag reduction ordinance, which was in a number of ways similar to the ordinance that we'll be discussing today. That ordinance was very successful in reducing the use of disposable bags at county businesses. Recently, the city of Berkeley was the first to adopt an ordinance requiring a charge for single-use cups. Their ordinance was preceded by extensive research assisted by faculty from the University of California at Berkeley, especially to determine the ideal amount for the proposed charge. And we were able to learn a great deal from the work that they did. More recently, the city of Watsonville passed a similar ordinance, the first in our county. And we've learned that the city of Santa Cruz is 
working on the same ordinance and is expected to hear that most likely in January. So it's a, a timely issue. As always to limit confusion among uh, businesses and the general public, it's always helpful to have a similar landscape of laws across county jurisdictions. So we will continue to work with the local cities toward that end. And that raises two specific issues for the board to consider in relation to the pro proposed ordinance. Uh, first is the effective date. Watsonville's ordinance, which has already passed, is scheduled to take effect July 1st of 2020. The draft ordinance for the city of Santa Cruz has the same proposed effective date, July 1st, 2020. The draft ordinance before you includes a later effective date of January 1st, 2021. The intent of that was to allow businesses abundant time to make the necessary adjustments and for county staff to do outreach and education to those businesses. However, if you feel it's important to have a consistent effective date and want to accelerate that timetable, I just want to assure you that we can adjust. That is your call. Um, similarly, the 25 cent charge in the draft ordinance was based on the extensive research I referenced done by the city of Berkeley which found that this was the lowest amount likely to prompt significant changes in consumer behavior. The draft ordinance for the city of Santa Cruz is used as the 25 cent charge. Watsonville, however, chose a lower charge of 10 cents out of concern for the impact on lower income members of their community. So again, that decision is up to you. The board also asked us to look into the feasibility of directing the, that all or some of the funds collected through such cup charges either come back to the county or to a use directed by the county. And um, of course there are many issues to consider when we would be putting such an issue before the public. Um, this would require an election if it is posed as a general revenue measure, then it just requires a majority of the voters and the funds will go to the county's general fund. I, I invite uh, county council to correct me at any point if I get any of this wrong. A special revenue measure would require two thirds of approval of the public and could go to whatever specific uses the board directs. Um, there's some scheduling issues to consider if the board wanted to target the March 3rd, 2020 election, um, the deadline for that would be December 6th of this year. For next fall's election, the deadline would be August 7th of 2020. Um, the board could direct all or part of the funds for county use for such expenses as litter cleanup or other environmental remediation measures as you choose or you would have the option of leaving some of those funds with the merchant staffs at their expenses. Um, one option might be to establish different tiers of revenue divisions to include, uh, to encourage greater sustainability on the part of local businesses. For example, uh, the use of fully compostable cups, which does increase their costs. This leads to uh, the question of what kind of revenue might we expect from a measure like this. And that's a challenging task. Uh, estimates on the number of single use disposable cups dispensed each year by county businesses depend on extrapolation, extrapolations from county and state numbers. There are no actual figures available from local businesses. So we take those national and state numbers and extrapolate based on our percentage of the population to come up with a number, but, but obviously that's a fairly crude estimate. And then returning to the uh, comparison of the single use bag ordinance, while that ordinance gained popularity very quickly, it's hard to say for sure if this measure would elicit the same response. We really just don't know. The revenue would come from anyone who chooses not to bring a cup that number is, of course, likely to change over time as 
more people become familiar with the new ordinance, but it's difficult to accurately estimate how many people that would be or how quickly the behavior would change. We do estimate that for each 10% of non-compliance, that's uh, each 10% of customers that continue to use disposable cups, that could potentially generate up to $1.2 million of annual revenue. I, I wanted to address just a few details um, in terms of outreach, enforcement, exemptions, and similar measures. The ordinance includes provision that any, uh, anyone who's participating in support programs such as SNAP or WIC would be exempt from such charges. They just have to present their cards. In the interest of health and safety, it allows businesses to refuse to use a cup provided by a customer that's dirty or damaged or any other, any other way uh, unsuitable for use in their judgment. And as always with our ordinances, there's a provision for them to request an exemption from the county if they feel there's a need for that. Of course, if the board approves the ordinance, Public Works will be conducting extensive outreach to affected businesses, both before the ordinance takes effect to be sure everybody's aware of it, and then afterwards to address any problems or issues that come up and to uh, help with the transition. And in the event that it's needed, the enforcement the uh, ordinance does include provisions for enforcement, including fines if necessary. So the recommendation is that the board take the following actions, approve the ordinance in concept, approve the attached notice of exemption from CEQA, schedule the ordinance for final adoption on November 19th, 2019, and direct Public Works to conduct outreach and education to local businesses. And we would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Mr. Caput. Yeah, a, a single use uh, disposable cup. We're talking about just about any uh, coffee cup uh, that might be uh, used at like a Starbucks. That's correct. It applies to both cold and hot beverages. Okay, and then all the you know fast food places like uh, Wendy's and correct. Carl's Jr. and all of those. That's right. Uh, what what percentage of those? Uh, my concern uh, is they're ending up. Uh, what percent will end up in the uh, landfill uh, even after this ordinance? Uh, how much are we, uh, uh, ball, uh, ballpark figure, are we reducing the impact of all of that turning out and ending up in the, uh, uh, in the landfill? We are. The board passed another measure in 2017 requiring all businesses in the unincorporated county to use only materials that can be recycled or composted. So that's already in effect. Uh, we are recycling and composting a great many of those cups and other kinds of food service materials. Although, of course, we still have a problem with cups being improperly disposed of. It's one of the most frequently littered items. So when they're improperly disposed of, then they are more likely to go into the landfill. Right. So the, the best scenario would be recyclable uh, single-use cups that end up going actually to recycle rather than to the landfill. Recycling or composting. And perhaps right. this is a good point to mention <laughs> that the legislature recently passed a measure that was signed by the governor that will require old food, food service businesses in the state to provide recycling and where appropriate compost bins for the use of their customers. <laughs> So we will be returning to the board soon with a measure to incorporate these new requirements into the county code. And we anticipate that that will be an additional measure right. that will make sure they're going into the right part of the waste stream. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I like the whole concept. And uh, if we have a container, let's say the big one uh, for uh, garbage, uh, a business will pay so much a month for that to be 
uh, weekly uh, dumped and that goes to the landfill. And then if they have a recycle one next to it, of, let's say equal size, what's the difference? How much money are they going to save? Because when they save money, they get real uh, 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 enthusiastic about the thing. If you uh, remember the priest I told you about that saved a thousand dollars a month because instead of going in the garbage, it was going in the recycle from bingo. There are potential savings. It's it's hard to give you a specific figure because there are many different service levels, many different combinations of trash, recycling, and food waste. Whenever we do sign up a new business for increased recycling or for new food waste service, we do encourage them to consider reducing their trash service because they need less. And it is a way of, of reducing their costs. So we have helped many businesses reduce their costs, but it would be difficult for me to give you a dollar figure. Okay, uh, kind of a dollar figure though. Let's say those, you know, how the, can I truck picks up the big container supervisor Caput? Let me just say so we have a 1030 scheduled item. All right, okay. uh, so I want to keep it just to this to the yeah, cups real, if we don't understand real quick just the ballpark figure of the equal size. Do you know Casey? One, um, one's recycle on your, and the other's garbage. It depends on your service level what you pay. Um, uh, once a week. So the the size of your uh, your bin or your cart determines your your charge. So if you do, there is for businesses a charge, a slightly lower charge for recyclable materials. Um, if you can downsize or right size your your refuse container, there will be um, some savings. I, I'll be saving hundreds of dollars a month. I I couldn't say um, <coughs> if you'd be saving some. <laughs> Uh, th uh, thanks. Anyway, uh, we're, we're just uh, considering putting this on for November 19th. Are we going to decide on 10 cents, 15, 20, 25 right now? Yeah, we're, Maybe. we're yes, we're I'll looking at it. Right right we'll the, the, hold on. Let's let's first we got to hear from board and then we got to hear from the public. Then we can go. Yeah, I uh, thank Mr. Chair. I support uh, this ongoing efforts to re reduce plastic waste to another litter. Uh, as we have, well, we're not first on this one, but we have been on most others, uh, plastic bags, toiletry items, and so forth. But I want to re reiterate uh, that I'd like to see a regional approach, but I, maybe that's past us by now. You know, it's to have some consistencies uh, among local jurisdictions, but here we have uh, Watsonville with, what, 25, City of Santa Cruz is drafting 25, um, I, I just, um, I don't know if it's too late to try to make that work, but, um, and then I'd just like to the, address the problem at the source of the manufacturing rather than the post-consumer level. I, I know that that's very difficult and takes a coordinated effort to do, but the, the board direction in August um, was to draft an order, ordinance um, in the unincorporated work, uh, and did we try, how did we, and we wanted a common fee. Did, did we, was it just too late to get in the game for that, I guess, uh, for with Santa Cruz and Watsonville being on the move to? Well, we have had discussions with city staff and elected officials and uh, including on the issues of implementation dates and common charges. But of course, the various city councils make yeah. their own decisions and sure. they, they don't always go the way we would wish. Right, and another direction was to provide information what it would take to implement fees as dedicated uh, to ongoing or addressing waste problem and environmental cleanup. And I wonder if you had those two subject matters, is that enough to make it uh, you know, a general issue rather than a specific one? Or how do you get um, the general and specific? I don't know if, if you could, uh, if that, if you had just those two, is that more than one? I might defer to council on this one. Well, how do you make it a general tax versus a specific? A specific tax is going to be, you're going to be devoting the revenue to a specific source. A general tax would be that the money just goes to the general fund. It can be spent on anything. Okay. So a general fund tax is a 50% uh, electorate and a special tax is a two thirds. Yeah, I'd sure like to see it go for, for environmental protection issues, greenhouse gas emissions or sea level rise or something like that. I don't know if, um, 
but that's my my thoughts on it anyway and i don't know how we could get there and make it a general tax but um, well, perhaps i should clarify that the measure before you today is just to approve the ordinance the discussion about whether to have an election directing the use of that charge was at the request of the board a separate item that you could act on today or defer to a later discussion. That could happen any time independently of passage of the ordinance. Okay. And if it, you mentioned this, just this is the last question, the retailer if it uses, um, refuses to fill a reusable cup, are they able to charge the consumer for a single cup use? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Hey, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you for your work in putting together this ordinance. It, de it definitely seems as though people are becoming much more aware of this as a, as a pollution problem. Uh, since we started talking about this, I've started carrying around reusable uh, cups when I, and I have lots of meetings in coffee shops. Uh, and I've seen more and more people using those cups. Um, so people are becoming aware, which uh, I think uh, really helps. Um, a couple different things. One is I think this is a good first step, but it's we need to do more than this. And maybe when we come back, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that. But uh, the, um, the, there's a couple different questions in the, in the presentation that, that you made. One is the question of fees. And uh, outside of Berkeley and Watsonville, are there other jurisdictions who are looking at this or who have passed this? Those are the only two so far. We would be the third. Yeah. And there I, are a number that are considering it. Right. And I know that I've talked to a number of Santa Cruz City Council members who uh, they're pretty committed to bringing this uh, to their council. Uh, and I've had some conversation with Capitola Council members who also have expressed an interest in this. And so I think there's an opportunity to have this as a countywide effort or almost a countywide effort. It is being discussed in Scotts Valley as well what action they might take. I couldn't say. Yeah. Um, I, uh, uh, I guess the question, uh, given the experience of the uh, plastic bag ban, the single use plastic bag ban, um, is a July 1st date reasonable? I mean, could, the, uh, uh, could we do the outreach? I mean, has, has there been much communication with the industry already? There's been a limited amount of communication, so it would create a challenge to pull our resources together and act soon. Um, we are struck by the fact that the city of Santa Cruz is preliminarily scheduled to act on this in January and then have the ordinance take effect in July. Admittedly, they've got a smaller geographic area and a, sm a smaller group of businesses. But uh, if they think they can do the outreach in six months, we think we can do it in eight. Uh, the, uh, the January 1st, 2021 implementation date allows abundant time. It's why that's in there. I think it's, it's a good safe date, but I just wanted your board to be aware that the cities have chosen a different one. So you could go in that direction if you choose. Yeah. Um, the last part uh, about the fees uh, and what to do with that, um, uh, is there any other place around the plastic bag ban or other things where um, the money is then uh, come back to the jurisdiction or whatever the stated purpose is? Some of the early plastic bag ordinances did take that form. However, they did not survive legal challenges. Um, there are slightly different forms of this in San Francisco and in Berkeley. Uh, they've taken the approach of adding these charges to business license fees. It's a simpler approach. It doesn't require a public election. So it's understandable why they might choose to go that way. Our county, of course, does not have business licenses, so that option is not currently available to us, but it's something the board might wish to consider in the future. Yeah, the, um, uh, do we have any idea of what the staffing needs would be to manage that kind of activity? I mean, I, I imagine with uh, collecting quarters from, uh, I don't know how many businesses would be affected by this, 
but there's probably an auditor, at least one auditor, some, uh, some other staff. I mean, has there been any thought given to that? There has, and you might imagine that if you're tracking the collection of funds from hundreds of businesses across the county that would then need to be remitted to the county, either on a monthly or quarterly basis, there would be a lot of work involved in tracking those funds, no doubt occasional audits. We estimate that that would be close to a full-time job for somebody, um, most likely in the auditor's office, sure. although possibly in public works. Um, all right, well, I look forward to the uh, conversation. Thank you, Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it, it's actually, I'm supportive of this. I think we can also do it in July and actually harmonize uh, the dates. I, I'm actually really supportive of the money coming back though. This is a big, this is actually really important to me. I, 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 it makes no sense to me to, if we're making a statement that these cups, destroy, that these single use items destroy the environment and that these businesses are party to that, why the money would go back to the businesses and not to the organizations involved in trying to remediate those issues. I mean, it, it's a, sounds like a strange issue to me that we would make those two totally contradictory statements. The reason that those early jurisdictions were found illegal is because under 218, they didn't go to the voters. I mean, so that's a very different situation than what we're proposing. This wouldn't be illegal. We'd go to the voters and ask them. I think we should initiate the ordinance. And then I think in November of next year, we should go to the voters and ask them, do you want the 25 cents to continue to stay with the businesses or do you want it to come back to uh, a wide variety of environmental programs? I think broadly enough defined to be a general tax. Realistically, the board can pass a resolution under a general tax thing to say that these are our, 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 our priorities that we wanna do with it. We've got, we contract with Save Our Shores to do cleanups and they're asking for more money. We've got another item regarding SSP where we have to do syringe cleanup and, and issues associated with that. We've got parks issues that are associated with cleanup and remediation on that. I mean. I've had public works come to me over the last eight years and constantly ask for more money for environmental based programs. And what we're saying is, is that this could be a significant amount of funding exactly for that, um, even if it's a full-time position. And even at the bottom end of the number that we're calculating, it's still a significant infusion of money to the county that we didn't have before. Um, and I don't know why we wouldn't try and do that. And if we wanna make it revenue neutral to the businesses through part of the measure, that's something should come back. So what I'll be seeking when this item comes back to the board today is additional direction that has that come back to us. I don't think today's the appropriate day to do it, but I think that that'll come back with a suite of options that'll say what it would charge, how much money it can bring, how it could be either revenue neutral or not to the businesses and let the board make the political decision of whether or not uh, and policy decision whether we think it's the best. But I think that the work that you've done here is uh, really sets the stage uh, for exactly that and it's very important. And I agree with, with both my colleagues and their comments that this should harmonize across the county. I imagine if the county goes today realistically, uh, the other cities will follow uh, pretty soon because it would just make sense for them to do exactly that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, real quick, uh, okay. uh, who, keeps <clears throat> uh, who keeps the money? Uh, like with the plastic bags, originally it was the uh, the business owner, I guess. So with this, let's say it's uh, ten cents or whatever. Uh, who actually that money goes to us or it goes? It Under goes the ordinance as proposed today, all of that money would stay with the business. With the business. So if the board chooses, um, we might in the future have an election asking the public to approve a different use of that money. That would be money, an election. But that is not, exactly, and that is not included in today's ordinance. So the business would keep the money. And Correct. If we could encourage them to also recycle, uh, I'm all for it, go ahead. Thank you. So, thank you. I guess the one thing I'd say is, you know, uh, having run a business, most coffee shops and burrito places and, you know, restaurants don't have a point of sale system which they can track specific items. So now you're asking people to now implement new point of sale systems in order to track exactly how many cups they've kept and charge it and presumably they charge ta be charged tax on it. You're talking about an, an enormous cost on a lot of small businesses for what will hopefully be a declining revenue stream as more and more people use compostable or reusable cups, then you know it's sort of like the tobacco tax where you start with the first five and you have a lot of money and then 
that by design you're going down over time. So before we talk about anything, we should talk to business owners about how much, I mean, if it's gonna be a full-time position for us in the finance audit, in the auditor's office, plus asking s small coffee shops to put in entirely new computer systems, it seems way out of proportion to what the, for what we're trying to do. So I, I agree with you, but if we're claiming it's such a big issue environmentally, then the, the board should be banning it then, right? I mean, my point is, is that we can't on the one side say that this is a huge environmental issue and then say that the businesses that are causing the environmental issue, it's too much of a burden for them to be providing the funding back. I mean, it's either an issue or it's not an issue. And if it's an issue, then then and we want to discourage the behavior. We even want to discourage the businesses that are providing this product to not be providing this kind of product, or this is a disincentive all the way around. And so I, I, I don't see it as seen a, with the plastic, with the paper bags, we've seen a dramatic de decrease in the impact without overburdening small business. So why would we not try the same thing here? And if we want to spend more money on environmental programs, let's pass additional taxes and spend more money or reallocate additional dollars for environmental programs. But to, 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 to put an enormous burden on small businesses without even talking to them and overhead on the county seems. I'm not arguing not to talk to them. That's why we would come back with an item in the future, right? Where this would all be outlined. Um, and we may differ on where we end up voting on it eventually on that regard. But I think that that's, if we voted today, then that would be exactly that. Part of this is an outreach process that we're actually directing them to do. So part of that outreach is part of the motion would be for them to also talk about this issue. And they're gonna come back with an item that outline what the challenges or opportunities are in this. Okay. Uh, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to come speak to us about this item. Hi there, I'm Monica McGuire. Uh, I've been a health coach for 20 years and one of my strongest areas is simple living in order to overcome the problem that several people have expressed here. Uh, the best phrase is that uh, reuse is infinitely better than recycling. I deeply appreciate you speaking up about the small businesses because it isn't right to burden, but it is possible to lead and what I could imagine this board doing easily here is to lead the reduction in greater ways by actually supporting small local businesses while letting the large conglomerates do their own work to handle the costs. But the costs to local small businesses could be borne by this county and the long-term lowering of the amount of that support that you're talking about is the most obvious thing in this county. So please consider something really outside of the box that's less expensive and quick. Thank you. Brad made up for the time went over. Thank you. Um, good morning, Supervisors. Benjamin Kogan here. Um, Mr. Caput, thank you for that question because if business owners are making the money, like if you're putting this uh, sanction, rule, levy, law, whatever you want to call it, and the business owners have to pay and that 10 cents, 25 cents goes to the government for the environmental programs, that's a tax. Make no mistakes that you're taxing the business owners. Mom and pops, coffee shops are gonna get affected most. Starbucks, that won't be a big deal for them. Uh, so if you wanna keep it local and keep it simple, uh, make no mistake that that's a tax. If it goes to the business owners, at least that's humble, noble, and just. And I wanna acknowledge that you're getting the dialogue started for being a wasteless and consumeless uh, society. Uh, the thing that comes to my mind, which is great that you're bringing this forward, is if you think of Burning Man and you talk to anyone who's been to Burning Man, everybody's got their cup. If you don't got your cup, you're not getting a drink, you're not getting water. Everyone walks around with a cup on their bag. It'd be great to see people carry the cups. Same with meth kits, if you had forks, stuff like that. Um, and what you guys are doing is you're trying to create the society where people are caring for themselves and carrying the cups and the mess kits and not wasting. But it's also using government regulations, laws and stuff, which then imposes tax, which then, um, uh, Coonerty, what you said was good because um, that means that we gotta hire auditors and auditors means that we gotta have um, people on government payroll, which means there are gonna be uh, pensions and all this stuff and more people. And then there's less money for the other services that we need and all that. So um, 
you know, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, some coffee shops, if you bring your own coffee mug, they'll give you 25 cents off the coffee. So now if you bring your own coffee mug, um, you save 25 cents, but you save, pay the same price. So I acknowledge you guys for getting it started. How do we create less mess? Um, and, and keep in mind, there's factors of biodegradable and, combust and compostable products. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors, and thank you for your time today. My name is Emily Pomeroy, and I'm an employee of Save Our Shores and a resident of Santa Cruz County. <clears throat> when it comes to plastics, the current reality is truly alarming. Disposable plastic products have permeated every aspect of our daily lives and are nearly impossible to avoid. According to the Ocean Conservancy, approximately 8 million metric tons of plastic are ending up in our oceans, in our marine life, and more recently discovered in our own bodies. Microfibers from our clothing and microplastics from broken down plastic debris have infiltrated our food chains and our water supplies. Some effects of this plastic consumption are known, such as cancer or reproductive harm, while other potential effects are yet to be understood. This is all not to mention that these products are derived from crude oil and natural gas, making their production a horrendous greenhouse gas contributor that's ever quickening the pace of global climate change, the severity of which is driving younger generations not to have children for fear that life on earth will not be suitable in the decades to come. I feel thankful to live in a county that takes action in these areas, and I want to acknowledge the important work that's been done thus far, such as the ban on disposable toiletry bottles used in hospitality industry, which was recently adopted statewide. I urge you to continue this fight and take further action as there's much more work to be done. I fully support a 25 cent fee on disposable cups and urge you to address other plastic items of concern, such as contact lenses, which are in need of more effective take back programs to prevent them from being flushed into our oceans, single use coffee pods, balloons that are mistaken for food by sea turtles and other marine life, single use water bottles for which there are known alternatives such as BPA and BPS free metal or glass containers, and the microfibers that are entering our waterways every time we wash our clothing. Items like these threaten the health of our ecosystems, the availability of our resources, and the health of all human beings. I thank you for listening and for continuing to act as a leader on these issues, paving the way for other counties, states, and countries to follow suit. Marilyn Garrett, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a drop in the bucket. I, I like to the, use the word ban, and somebody talked about uh, the manufacturing process. It's, uh, I think recycling is actually a myth because we're helping the corporations keep producing their toxic ways, and we're good and we're trying to recycle it, and you can't keep up. The figures this young woman gave on the, the debris and the contamination is just huge. And I see it as a system problem. I remember this bumper sticker that said, pollution is somebody's profit, and corporations producing this, all these waste profit. I read in terms of the plastic, that there's a hundred, no, I heard it on the radio, $180 billion a year more in new plastic production. So when you talk about single use or whatever, that's not getting to the source. Where is it coming from? And I think of Dr. Sander Steingraber's book, Living Downstream, an ecologist looks at cancer and the environment. This is paraphrased, I recommend the book. It is intolerable to be regulating, monitoring, permitting known and suspected carcinogens into the environment rather than prohibiting their generation in the first place. So the problem is how do we stop it at the source, the production, the corporations that are running the country. And I feel extremely sad for children nowadays who are brought up in this totally toxic environment. So I'd like to see corporations producing this prohibited or, or dismantled. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. Uh, Rod Caborn, uh, Save Our Shores. 
and I'm very encouraged with uh, the discussion that you had. It looks like uh, you just need to square away the details. Uh, very important uh, that we do make progress, and I'd just like to draw your attention to uh, Supervisor Leopold's instincts uh, that we need to do more. And obviously, you've already stated that uh, you're wanting to eliminate water bottles from from county facilities, so clearly that's something that you consider important. And so I would like to state again, uh, and this is in synergy with everyone else's speech and instinct, that we need to be bigger. We need to be bigger than this. And it's a good first start, no doubt about it. But uh, let's find something that really will find public attention. And I go back once again to the bottle. The bottle is emblematic of our throwaway society. And if we make a bold statement on that, that's crucial. I certainly acknowledge the fact that change takes place and it's a process, but it's a process of big, bold things. There are 50 billion bottles that are produced each, each year. And every American gets a couple of hundred of them. Now, if you imagine confining that to your house, now, 200, and that with four family members, you know, that's a sort of almost a thousand every year. And it doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't, it just breaks down into small fibers, as you all well know. So if you start thinking of confining it to a house, since everybody does the bottle, and the bottle is a kind of symbolic and emblematic, everyone can relate to that. And so they realize that China's not taking our rubbish any longer. Mal Malaysia's not taking it any longer. Singapore's burning it so let's think about the metaphor that's here and let's follow up on this bottle because it can be so powerful and you guys have the ability here as a leader in California thank to you. get it done thank you Good morning supervisors uh, chairman Coonerty I'm going to be very brief today. I would just like to say, please get this one done. The cup charge is a fairly easy ask, I think. Um, I choose not to weigh in whether the fee goes back to the businesses or um, is put on the ballot as some sort of a measure simply because we could be one of the organizations to benefit from that. So I would choose to not um, weigh in on that topic. Um, <clears throat> what I do really want to say, though, is Again, this is an easy ask to get done. What we really need action on are three absolutely critical issues. Rod touched on one of those, which is getting plastic bottles out of our waste stream, off our streets, off our beaches, uh, stop being produced by fossil fuel industry. We need action immediately on microfibers. We're breathing it, we're ingesting it, we're drinking it. <clears throat> And then we should also do something about balloons. Again, that is a simple ask. They are killing wildlife. They are entangling them. They are being ingested by wild, uh, wildlife. They're unnecessary. Sure, kids might stamp their feet and cry if they don't get one at a birthday party, but the next time a shiny item goes by, they'll forget all about the balloons and move on. It's not a trauma that they're gonna live with for the rest of their lives. We need to stop what's happening to the destruction of our habitats, our ocean, and everything that lives in it, as well as think about our human health. Thank you. Morning, Manu Koenig, District One. Uh, I'm also a sanctuary steward, and just this last Saturday, I was at the 26th Avenue Corcoran Lagoon Beach Cleanup, and uh, newsflash, number one item still picked up on the beaches are cigarette butts by a factor of 2.5 to one. So let's, we do need to do more than this. Um, we have to take action at the number one item found at beach cleanups, and we need to ban cigarette butts. 
We have draft legislation from our very own zero waste manager. Of course, uh, our beloved assembly member, uh, Mark Stone, has been working on this since 2014. Um, let's get it done right here in the county and set a precedent for the rest of the state. Cigarette butts are toxic to the environment. They provide no health benefits uh, to smokers. This is a, a, another one that you can take action on. Uh, if you believe in, in doing more, then agendize this for a future uh, agenda. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Uh, and I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation action. Supervisor McPierce, anyone? Supervisor uh, Friend? Well, I'll move the recommended actions with additional direction that it, uh, the ordinance take effect or the, the uh, program take effect on July 1st of 2020. The additional direction would be that, that Public Works come back with what a uh, uh, ballot measure could look like after they do the, the outreach for a potential November election in, well, I mean, Tim, if you could tell me what you think would be in a, a reasonable amount of time. That's fine. Uh, in March of, of next year. And, uh, <clears throat> what I'd like to see uh, uh, maybe add to that a, a report on how much uh, we're going to eliminate uh, going to the landfill. Uh, because if this doesn't eliminate some of that or significantly, uh, we're not doing it much of anything other than uh, raising the uh, price of a cup of coffee. That, so, that's fine for additional yeah, fine. direction. Um, is there a second? I'll second. Okay. <laughs> and I think council had a, had a point. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, this will require it to come back for first read on November 19th to change the date from, uh, from 2020 backwards. So we won't be able to adopt it on second read and that's just informational only. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, and to, uh, what I'd add is that during your outreach, what I'm going to be looking for is that you've talked to um, a majority of the small businesses in the unincorporated area and understand what the administrative burden of, of, of collecting these, these funds would look like. Yeah, I, I, I support that. You know, I, I don't know what, whether a ballot measure makes a good sense or not. Uh, I know that it's important for us to really talk to uh, folks. We, when we've adopted other ordinances affecting industries, we've worked hard to reach uh, outreach to them. And I hope not only staff, but the, the supervisor will also take a role in, in doing that and making the case. Um, because I think that's important to get that feedback. I also think when we, when we took this up in February and then and had it come back, <laughs> Uh, this was only one of the items that was on that list. And we, we did look at uh, items uh, around contact lenses. Um, and it seems from the, uh, the information that you collected that, um, that it's really not being done by local optometrists in terms of the, uh, in terms of the recycling of those um, uh, daily contacts, uh, correct? And you know, I just think that that's another area where this board should also uh, step out and, and work on. Um, and I, I also uh, uh, there, there was a there was a representative of a mother's group who came to see me to talk about the mylar balloons. They they're really against the mylar balloons, uh, and it was interesting t to me because I thought that mothers' groups would be the ones who would be most in favor of the mylar balloons, as they are the ones who use the mylar balloons. And I think we should do some more outreach to t take a look at um, at ridding the environment of of those balloons as well. And uh, I, given that we know that the uh, contact lens recycling isn't happening now. I'm wondering if the maker of the motion would uh, see as an additional item that w we come back with an ordinance around that as well. Um, and that we look again at the Mylar balloon uh, uh, piece to see whether that's something that um, we could also do here in Santa Cruz County. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. Um, we have to take, I know people are here for the 17th and Capitola. We have to take a five minute break to allow translation services to be set up. So uh, we are gonna come back uh, at 1055 in order to um, hear that item. And you'll 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna go uh, to f items 15, 16 uh, that are uh, the scheduled item. And 17. Hmm? On the syringes. That'll be after. After. All right, everybody, we're gonna be uh, coming back to calling the meeting back to order. We'll be now hearing items 15, 16, and 17. Uh, they're all related to uh, seventh, the 17th and Capitola project. Um, and so first we'll be hearing number item 15, which is we'll be acting as the board of supervisors for the uh, Santa Cruz Redevelopment Successor Agency and we'll be considering an approval of an affordable housing and property disposition agreement by and between Santa Cruz County Redevelopment Successor Agency and the MP Live Oak Associates LP, a partner established, a partnership established by Midpen Housing, authorized by the CAO to, ex will authorize the CAO to execute the agreement and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the CAO. And we have Peter Detlef from the Economic Development Agency explaining what this property disposition first item is about. All right, good morning members of the board. Um, yeah, just to, to recap, we've got three items um, before you today to uh, discuss the approval for the Capitola Road mixed use project. First, as the redevelopment success successor agency, you will consider approval of the disposition of the Capitola Road site. Second, in item 16, you'll consider approval of the proposed entitlements, and Lausanne will provide that presentation. And finally, as a companion to item 15, approval of item 17 will provide $5 million in funding for the proposed project, and Julie will um, present on that item. Um, let's see. So just briefly, following the uh, redevelopment dissolution in 2011, the successor agency approved the long range property management plan in 2013 that set forth the path for disposition of the site as required by the California Department of Finance. In April of 2017, the county hosted a community meeting to identify a vision for the site and to guide a request for qualifications process to select a preferred developer for the site. The successor agency entered into an exclusive negotiation agreement with Midpen Housing in December of uh, 2017 for a mixed use affordable housing project as an outcome of that RFP process. Subsequently, Midpen hosted two community meetings in April 2018 and another in October 2018, accepting public input and refining the proposed project. The affordable housing and property disposition agreement before you today sets forth the terms and conditions for the sale of the property based on the highest and best use and full appraised value as required by the California Department of Finance and is consistent with the community vision for the site identified in April of 2017. Following this approval, the agreement will be subject to approval by the Consolidated Oversight Board in January. So um, as we're <clears throat> today we ask that you um, approve the recommended rec recommended actions. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll first I'll ask if anyone has any questions about uh, the property disposition agreement. Seeing none, I'll now ask if members of the public want to speak to us about the property disposition agreement. That's, that's the first item. The second item will be the actual project. The third item will be the uh, allocation of funds for the affordable housing component. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of rural Aptos. Because this involves the Santa Cruz County Redevelopment Successor Agency, I want to know how this ties in with the removal of the R combining district that, that would provide the affordable housing that is now the site of the, the current Kaiser, proposed Kaiser. I understand that these units are being transferred from the requirement of that R combining zone. And I would like to make that very, have you make that very clear for the public this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments about the property disposition? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Good morning, Chair. There'll be a lot to say about this project. Uh, the, 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 the thing I wanna say about this, this is an important project for uh, Live Oak. Um, and in order to start this process, we did hold uh, community meetings. We heard from the community about uh, what it is they want on this and the other commercial uh, uh, parcel that is next door. 
Uh, we had hoped that, that we'd have one joint project, but we have the project that's in front of us, uh, not for lack of trying on the second one. Um, the, the, this property was bought uh, 30, over 30 years ago uh, for a library site. And for various reasons, the library was built um, on Portola. It's a beautiful library. Uh, but this site uh, over the years has not been, that has been talked about lots of different ways, but it was never planned. And so it's part of that long range uh, management plan. We went out to the community. Uh, once we heard what people were interested in, we did hold uh, at least two commu other community meetings after that, that were well attended, over a hundred people at every meeting. And uh, at those meetings, uh, cause we checked in everybody that um, 90 percent or more of the people who were at that meetings were from Live Oak. Uh, so this is a community project uh, and uh, since it was purchased with redevelopment funds uh, which is money that uh, had uh, has always has helped uh, Live Oak for so long um, it's great to see this project moving forward. I do think it's important uh, uh, to note that that the um, the, we are selling this project uh, for roughly three and a half million dollars. Uh, the county gets a small portion of that. The schools get a portion of it. Fire districts, library, other taxing agencies um, get it. So this project not only benefits um, the people who will live there, but it also it, it, uh, benefits the other community institutions. I do think it's important for us to not just casually take the, the small amount of money that the county's getting and, and just put it into the black hole that is the county budget. But we should have a discussion here at the board about how to use those funds. There, in my conversations with uh, staff, um, it's, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, question as to how much that will be, 23%, 18%, 11%. And so uh, I'd like to move the recommended actions on this with one additional direction that we come back and have a board discussion about how to use the funds from this project. Okay, we've got a motion by Leopold and a second by McPherson. Uh, all those... Um, uh, just so it's been, it's been suggested to me that uh, we have a, a, a date uh, and maybe by our last meeting in February. I mean, some, one, one question. Um, sure. If they, I, I, um, okay, we have a motion on the floor, but if the clinic, uh, the clinic projects go first, are there assurances of what um, happens to the affordable housing project? I think that is built in. Um, the way the contract is structured is to protect the housing component. Of the disposition? Yes. I can take that on. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, the agreement anticipates, it's a complicated agreement. I'm right. sure you had time to read it over the weekend. <laughs> um, it anticipates, it, it's primarily between, it is between the redevelopment successor agency and Midpan housing. However, it acknowledges the very closely relation, close relationships with the county um, as the housing successor agency, and of course, as the entitling body, and also of the clinics who were part of the overall approval. Um, the agreement does provide for either the clinics proceeding first or the housing project proceeding first. And um, in either case, there's protections around it to ensure um, the county's interest. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All those. I think your microphone has to be on. Okay. You just thank Midpin. Yeah. All right. So uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. We're now moving on to item number 16, which is a public hearing to consider application 181579, Midpin Housing, for a mixed use development consisting of a two story medical dental office with a retail store and a housing complex containing 57 affordable units and requiring a vesting tentative map, a commercial development per permit, a zoning map amendment a planned unit development, a sign exception and design review, accept the determination that the project is exempt in accordance with this California Environmental Quality Act and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director. So. 
Well, good morning, uh, members of the board. Before I start my, comp my presentation, which is, I'll, I'll try to go through the project quickly. It's a, a, a fairly big project and there are a lot of moving parts, so I will expect there to be questions at the end. And I also just wanted to say that the applicant has prepared a presentation that would follow directly after mine. And so it would be nice if they, I think they have about four minutes yeah. um, before we get into the public hearing. Correct. All right. So with that, I will begin. The project site is midway between the cities of Santa Cruz and Capitola and between Highway 1 and the Monterey Bay. The four parcels that are included in the 3.65 acre site are on the south side of Capitola Road between 375 and 875 <coughs> feet west of 17th Avenue. To the north and east, there are commercial parcels that are along Capitola Road and then to the west and south, there are single family and multifamily residential neighborhoods. Except for the two existing dwellings that are on the site, it's currently vacant, uh, mostly a grassland with groupings of trees. The surrounding residential neighborhoods contain a wide variety of one and two story homes. There are also multifamily developments and apartment complexes. Commercial developments include one and two story retail office, service and mixed use buildings. Uh, the Live Oak Elementary School is at the corner of 17th Avenue and the Live Oak Community Resources Center is on 17th Avenue just north of Capitola Road. The mixed use project consists of a two story res uh, commercial building with a central public plaza at the, begin at the front here on Capitola Road, behind which there'll be four three-story multifamily residential buildings that are built around a private open space. All of the structures would be in a landscape setting that includes parking, circulation, open space, and a community garden. The proposed developments in the C1 zone district, a designation that allows mixed-use projects. The zoning is consistent with the neighborhood commercial general plan designation. The project's been designed in accordance with the commercial uses chart, which allows medical and dental offices in the C1 zone district up to 51% of the floor area and allows affordable residential uses up to 67%. As proposed, the office uses would constitute 31.7% and the residential apartments would be 66.9%. The maximum number of units for the site as a whole is determined using standards for the urban high density general plan designation. And applying that to the 3.6 acre net developable site area, you could have up to 62 units, but the project includes 57. The four existing parcels will be adjusted to create two land areas, one of 1.24 acres for the commercial uses and one of 2.36 acres for the housing. A 0 0.05 acre strip of land along Capitola Road will also be dedicated for street purposes. So that the ownership of the commercial building can be split, the 1.24 acre parcel will contain two airspace condominiums, one within each wing of the building, and the surrounding land will be a common area. Because of this, this adjustment creates condominium parcels, a tentative map is required. To most accurately reflect the residential only use on the 2.36 acre parcel, a zoning map amendment is proposed to add the regional housing need or our combining district to this portion of the mixed use development. With the rezoning, the project requires the approval of a planned, use to planned unit development or PUD for the rezoned area. The PUD includes details of all the development standards for that residential parcel. So that the project's 57 residential units will be consistent with the density <coughs> standards for the R combining district on that parcel, a 20% density bonus has been requested for the 2.36 acre parcel, which will then allow for a density of 24 units per acre on that rear parcel. For some reason this, um, my, I do apologize, my presentation is putting all the layers that are supposed to come in in phases on together. It's a little confusing, I apologize. Um, a master plan is also required, and this includes the residential and commercial developments, um, a public plaza, uh, all of the shared facilities, including parking, roadways, and landscaping. There's a potential third driveway site also included, which would link the site to the corner where the Live Oak supermarket and the laundromat and the vacant land south of that is currently now, but we're allowing a potential link to that in the future should that redevelop and so that we can have a comprehensive development. 
the commercial and residential buildings have been designed with a different but complementary aesthetic. The flat roofed two story building will be compatible with the existing developments along Capitola Road. There'll be large areas of glazing that'll link the interior of the buildings to the public street and the main entrances will be defined by wood detailing. The building is broken up by a variety of colors and materials that include wood appearance siding, stone, stucco, and natro, natural wood. The color palette is comprised of warm earth tones and muted grays. Centrally located in the center of the U-shaped building is a public plaza with seating, a sunken lawn, and sculptural elements. And this space will also contain an interpretive historical installation that honors the history of the site. A large fern pine tree that's currently on the frontage will be retained to help screen and soften the, pro the, pro the frontage as well as to define the character of that plaza. The three-story residential buildings include hip and gabled roofs, varied roof planes, covered porches and decks, and will not be significantly visible from Capitola Road. The colors for these include light gray and dark gray, a gray beige with, and then red brown doors and black or white trim details. Wood effect board siding will be mounted both horizontally and vertically to further break up the facades. The residential buildings surround a private garden with two barbecue areas and a children's playground. Other community facilities include a community room, after school services, laundry, property management office, and bicycle storage. The commercial and residential structures are all set back away from the adjacent residential parcels and will be screened and softened in views from adjacent homes by new tree planting and also by existing mature trees that will be retained. Signage includes 168 square feet of building mounted signs for the clinics and retail space and two 16 square foot monument <coughs> signs for the housing, one of which will be adjacent to Capitola Road and one adjacent to the community building <coughs> setback. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure what happened there. Where are we? Here we go. I apologize. Um, access to the site is via two driveways. Um, uh, On-site parking is provided in a shared parking lot, which is situated mostly in the southwestern corner, with additional parking spaces throughout the site. The parking demand analysis concluded that the 190 parking spaces provided will be adequate to accommodate the projected parking demand. And to ensure that residential parking will always be available, one space will be allocated for the exclusive use of each unit. In addition, there will be 109 bicycle parking spaces on the site. Just finishing up on that, uh, the traffic report concludes that the mixed use development would result in low vehicle miles traveled numbers and help to create a more sustainable community. The report also shows that chip trip generation by the project would not significantly impact intersections in the area. Um, I'm gonna go back to the previous slide. Um, a second eastbound lane will be constructed along the project frontage, which will um, implement a portion of the county's capital improvement program for widening Capitola Ro Capital Road, and that will be constructed with this project. Um, and then another, um, traffic issue is that to help maintain traffic flows along Capitola Road, the eastern driveway, uh, marked here with a green arrow, will operate only as a right turn in and right turn out lane. Um, and then another um, item is that the, for safety reasons, the Metro bus stop in front of the property will be relocated eastwards away from the new pedestrian crossing at 15th Avenue. The drainage system has been designed in accordance with all of the requirements of the county design criteria for a large project and will connect to the existing storm drain in Capitola Road. The preliminary drainage plans have been reviewed and approved by the Department of Public Works Stormwater Management Division. The project will provide low cost medical and dental services for the community together with rental units for very low income tenants and a much, which is a much needed housing type. The staff therefore recommends that your board certify that the proposal qualifies for a statutory exemption from CEQA pursuant to public resources code section 
1.59 and adopt the ordinance rezoning the residential of the portion of the parcel to add the R combining district to the existing C1 zoning, adopt the ordinance granting a PUD to establish development standards for the residential portion of the project site and approve application number 181579 based on the findings and conditions set out in the staff report as reckoned by the Planning Commission of August 28th, 2019. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comprehensive report. Um, we're now going to have the applicant uh, make the presentation. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Betsy Wilson. I'm a director with Midpen Housing Corporation. Thank you, Peter. And um, I'm here with my partners. We're gonna do a joint presentation today. Just talk a little bit about the history of our organizations um, and the work that we've done in developing this concept. Mm okay. What am I doing? Roller. Ooh, other way, okay. So um, MidPen will be celebrating its 50th year next year. And we've been working in Santa Cruz County, building safe, affordable housing for low-income Californians since the 90s. Uh, we have more than a dozen properties here. Um, we most recently opened Pippin Apartments in Watsonville, and that was a 46-unit community, and we had over 2,500 applications. So the need certainly isn't abating, it's increasing in terms of what we're providing in the community. Um, and this location is a wonderful place for us to be able to provide affordable housing near where people work. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my partners to talk a little bit about the clinics. Thanks. Uh, good morning, my name is Leslie Connor. I'm CEO of the Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. Um, I'm here because we are enthusiastically partnering with Dentis and MidPen to build a new health center at 1500 Capitola Road. Um, we have been improving health of the community for over 45 years. We opened our downtown women's health center in 1974, which we own. And in 2014, we expanded by renovating a family health center in Live Oak, which we lease. Uh, we serve over 11,000 low income patients, 40% of whom are children. Um, we manage a budget of 15 million a year, effectively offering comprehensive primary care, pediatrics, prenatal care, integrated behavioral health, and much, much more. Uh, we were designated as a healthcare for the homeless site, so we serve over 900 patients currently who are homeless. 250 of them are under the age of 18. And because of that, and an, and an eye toward prevention and addressing childhood trauma, we have invested uh, significantly in a pediatric center of excellence, partnering with the county on its Thrive by Three efforts as well. We employ physicians, nurses, licensed clinical social workers, and other administrative and clinical staff. Our workforce is local and mission-driven. In 2012, we became an FQHC. We adhere to rigorous com compliance requirements that are monitored by both the state and federal government. As an FQHC, we, expect, we uh, accept all patients regardless of their ability to pay. The healthcare landscape is rapidly changing, and our 45-year history speaks to our effective financial management, clinical impact, and success as an employer. On behalf of myself and our board of directors, we're eager to continue improving the health of our patients in the community through a new state-of-the-art primary care clinic at 1500 Capitola Road. Let's see if I can do it the right direction. Hi, I'm Sherry Storm and I'm the Chief Development Officer for Dientes Community Dental Care. Uh, 27 years ago, Dientes Dental Care began as a volunteer effort to serve the low-income um, people with dental care. And today, we operate three clinics, serve over 11,000 people, half of, which, half of whom are children, provide comprehensive services, and are the only provider for specialty care for medical, provide, for medical patients in the county. With a 30 site outreach program, we reach hundreds of children every year, and, uh, providing care at their schools and on site dental care to people experiencing homelessness at Housing Matters. We provide oral health services at the County Clinic in Watsonville, pediatric specialty care, as well as services for adults at our main clinic on Commercial Way, and we serve one of the most economically disadvantaged neighborhoods in our county in Beach Flats. Dientes is an innovative leader. We've conducted a, a 
2016 oral countywide oral health needs assessment. The strategic plan later developed was by uh, prominent community leaders, resulted in a million dollars of state funds to implement <coughs> increased access to dental care. And we're using mid-level providers in our staffing model, something rarely done in public health, which saves costs and allows us to provide care to more patients. We also offer education, uh, loan repayment as part of a uh, trying to become an employer of uh, preference and wellness programs to recruit and retain higher quality staff, a challenging endeavor in a uh, community this size. With a population of approximately 17,000 people and a 14% poverty rate, Live Oak is one of the most ethnically and economically diverse communities in Santa Cruz County. The median home price in Live Oak is $765,000, which is great if you're a property owner. But half of our residents rent homes or apartments under 800 square feet for an average of $2,200 a month, with rents increasing at five to 6% per year. This situation creates an environment where 26% of Live Oak elementary school children are considered homeless many living in motels or cars with multiple families uh, sharing a space meant for one. This makes affordable housing a huge priority for people in our area. And while the number of uh, insured residents in Live Oak has increased since the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, access to care is still a challenge with thousands of people in the community, excuse me, in the county, in need of a regular source of medical care, including many who need behavioral health or other support services. In fact, the Live Oak Family Health Centers, which opened in 2014, was the first doctor's office to locate in Live Oak. Finally, access to dental care is key to holding a job and keeping housed, but only 15% of adults in Santa Cruz County on Medi-Cal are receiving services. And dental care is ranked as a number one need for seniors as they do not receive dental benefits in Medicare making access to affordable services a priority. Both Dientes and Santa Cruz Community Health Centers share a commitment to the residents of Live Oak. Aligning our unique business models with community needs are what have driven us all those year, all these years. 1500 Capitola Road is the next step in our evolution, ensuring good health, well-being, educational success, and future opportunity. We're excited by not only serving more people, but by serving them better, going deeper with services, integrating dental care on-site, expanding behavioral health, adding a pharmacy, which will be open to the public, adding optometry, and laying a foundation for future specialty services. Our project is an economic driver. For the health center alone in 2018, a study completed by the nonprofit Capital Link showed almost $30 million in total economic impact from direct health center spending and associated community spending driven by our growing staff and programs. Capital Link also estimated 1.6 million in state and local tax revenues and 20 million in savings to the overall health system. Finally, as we all know, Santa Cruz is one of the most expensive housing markets in the nation. Every single local institutional strategic plan, including the county's own, has prioritized increasing housing stock as a way to improve the quality and viability of life here. In fact, housing is healthcare as endorsed by the Health Improvement Partnership, a coalition of all the healthcare providers in Santa Cruz County. This project led by three longstanding community partners is smart, it's sustainable, and it's responsive, an essential health and housing hub in the heart of Live Oak. So we, we have a few more slides, but I'm conscious of the time and I feel like Leslie did a great job wrapping that up. So we're gonna stop there. All right, thank you so much. We're now gonna have an opportunity for members of public to, public to speak to us about this item. If you would like to speak, please line up if you're able. We do have translation services uh, available, those who need them. Come on up. Good morning, um, Carol Childers. I'm um, a resident of Live Oak. I'm a homeowner in Live Oak. I work in Live Oak. 
But at this point, um, I live on Leela Court. I live at the far end of the, the cul-de-sac. The traffic is already hellacious. Um, we have drainage problems because of the way our street was built back and whenever it was. Um, you know, I know we all need housing. I'm aware of that. I work a full-time job and a part-time job to keep a roof over my head. Um, but I don't see how this is gonna benefit those of us in our neighborhood that are near retirement age, that are retired. It's going to drive us out. I know my son, when I told him, he said, mom, it's time to bail, come to Oregon. And you know what? I'm seriously now considering it because if this project goes in, my quality of life in my little neighborhood where I've been for 18 years is gonna change dramatically. Thank you. My name is Carol Fuller and I became aware of this project as somebody who's had dental work um, all my life, a lot of it, starting at about five, I had 10 to 12 cavities every year. And in about a month, I go to my dentist to see if I can have my sixth implant. So I'm personally well aware. I mean, so I'm sort of here motivated. I was, I've been a donor to Dientes. And when I became aware of this project, I thought it was a great project. And the more I learned about it, the better project it seemed. I too would like to live in Santa Cruz of about 30 years ago where Live Oak was largely rural and, and green and, the boardwalk was still kind of derelict in the winter. I like that Santa Cruz. I lived here as a kid for a while. I lived in Watsonville for three years. And, um, but I think this is, we, we have to face reality. We need housing. The clinic work and the, the dentistry for low-income families, I, I had no idea that 85% of the kids at the school next door were eligible for free lunch. But anyway, so, so I'm here to support the project. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Araceli Contreras. I am the Family Engagement Coordinator for Live Oaks Cradle to Career Initiative. Yes. I am here with a group of parents from our Parent Leadership Committee who are in support of the project and have been since the very beginning. Uh, I am also here in support of the project. Um, the presentations were great. Um, there's a high need in our community, in our county for a project like this. And it will be great for our community um, our county and our youth. Thank you. Thank you. Sí, you bueno. Can... Sorry. Uh, sí, buenos días. Mi nombre es Dolores López. Uh, soy una mamá de la comunidad uh, Laibo. Uh, uh, pues yo estoy a favor de la clínica y del de, de de las casas de bajos ingresos porque pues, no necesitamos uh, un, uh, uh, como para, para las personas de bajos que somos, está muy cara la renta, pero estamos, estamos contentos a ese, a ese que están a, a favor, estoy yo a favor para, y es bueno para la comunidad. Gracias. Thank you, gracias. Good morning. Hold on, he's gonna ditch, we're gonna get translation. Yes, good morning. My name is Dolores Lopez. I am one of the mothers of the community of Live Oak. Well, I'm in favor of the clinic and, and uh, low affordable housing because we need them. We, we need them for the people of low income. Like we are, uh, the rents are very high, but we are, but we are happy if, at that, that they are in favor. I'm in favor for, and it's good for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Diana Valadez y soy madre líder de Cuna Carrera de la Escuela de Laibok por cuatro años seguidos. Estoy aquí porque estoy a favor de la nueva ubicación de la clínica de East Cliff entre Capitola y 17 Avenue. La clínica me ha ayudado a mí mucho con mi salud, al igual que la de mi familia. Cuando voy a mis citas tengo que ir caminando por de 30 a 40 minutos uh, porque yo no manejo. Y ahora con la nueva ubicación solo tendré que caminar por 5 a 8 minutos. 
Sé que también hay mucha dificultad para personas mayores para poder tener el acceso a llegar a la clínica. También quiero añadir que yo como madre líder escucho muchas personas diciendo que sufren por conseguir una vivienda a bajo costo. Y esta también sería una muy buena posibilidad para las personas que lo necesitan. En verdad, hay muchas familias que están viviendo en una situación muy difícil. Recordemos que los niños tienen que vivir en un ambiente feliz, sano y seguro. Gracias. My name is Taya Valavez. I am a mother and leader of Kratos, from Kratos to, uh, for four years. I am here because I'm in support of the new uh, building in the East Cliff in Capitola and 17th Avenue. The clinic has helped me a lot with my health if, if to my family. When I go to my, my meetings, I have to go walking about 30, 40 minutes because I don't drive. Now with the new clinic, I would only walk for five to eight minutes. I know there's uh, difficulties for people who are elderly to have access to go to the clinic. I also want to add, as a mother and a leader, I hear a lot of people saying that they suffer to have an affordable housing. And this is also a, a good possibility for the people that need them. And for reality, there's a lot of families that are living in situations that are very difficult. Let's remember that the children need to live in an ambient that is happy and secure. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, buenos días. Soy Yuri Fajardo. Soy madre de Liveoak. Um, estoy a favor de la propuesta que están haciendo. Me gustaría porque estuviera más cerca y tal vez. Um, ¿Por qué está más cerca de la escuela? Hay más, hubiera más, um, más beneficios para uno. Y es todo. <laughs> Gracias. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Judy Fajardo. I'm a mother of Live Oak. I am here in favor of the proposal that you are making. I would like to because it will be closer. You know, maybe because that is closer to the school and it will, there will be more, more benefits for all of us. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, buenos días. Mi nombre es Sandra Hernández. Soy una mamá de la escuela de Laibok. Y vengo porque estoy um, a favor de la propuesta uh, de la nueva ubicación de, de nuestra clínica de la East Cliff. A mis hijos los tengo en, en la clínica de East Cliff y también los tengo en la clínica de dientes. Para mí sería más fácil eh, y más accesible tener a mis, eh, poder sacar a mis niños de la escuela y enseguida ir a, las, a sus citas. Eh, no tendría que manejar, todo estaría más, más cerca para mí. Y también que eh, habrán viviendas para, para otras personas que lo necesitan. Hay mucha gente que necesita en nuestra comunidad de Laibok. Gracias a todos. Gracias. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Sandra Hernandez. I am a mother of the School of Laibok. I come here because I'm in favor of the proposal of the new building in our clinic of the East Cliff. Uh, my children, I have them in the clinic of East Cliff, and I also have them in the clinic of dental clinic. For me, it would be more, much easier and more accessible to have, to be able to take my children out of school and take them to, to their, to their uh, meeting times. I did not have to drive. All of this will be closer for me. And also, that there will be housing for other people that need it. There's a lot of people that need housing in our community of Live Oak. Thank you to all of you. Good morning. My name is Yadira Canizal, and I'm here um, as a mother from Del Mar Elementary School. And I'm here to support the, the housing 
especially, because it's a lot of need in our, in our community. And also the, the dental and, and um, clinic, because as for me, I am mother of four kids, so I can arrange my kids in one appointment or in the, in the same day I can take it all from the school and it's less time that they lost from school to get to the clinic and I can arrange all in one day, possibly. And yeah, but here, the most important thing that I'm here is to support the affordable housing because it's really, it's really a need in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Supervisors. Um, it's rare that we get an opportunity for a 100% affordable project in a walkable neighborhood with rigorous community inputs with health amenities that will decrease the number of vehicle miles traveled in the county. It is inspiring to see these plans. I urge you to approve this project today. Any delay means more displacement of people that this project can help. And any delay can mean that a project falls apart due to funding issues. If for some reason this project is not ready to be approved today, I urge you to add both funding and zoning waivers to increase the number of units to, to make up for those people that have been displaced due to delay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Carolyn O'Donnell Shimmick and I've been living in Santa Cruz for more than 30 years. And I'm also a longtime client of the Santa Cruz Women's Health Center. I'm not sure I fall in that low income bucket, but I still go there. Um, I'm really glad that I wasn't too busy to meet with Dr. Catherine Webb when she showed up at my office in the early 1990s, because what resulted was a grant from Catholic Healthcare West that met that funded the first study and the first work to develop Deontay's Community Dental Clinic. I'm proud to be part of that village that birthed this clinic, that started these services that were so desperately needed and continue to be needed within this community. Um, I wrote that first grant proposal and worked with Dr. Webb. Um, we went to Sacramento, we went to all the folks that sat up here at the time and really worked towards get that open. But it took a whole village and there are many more people in this community that made Deontay's be where it is today. Um, we usually don't think about dental care unless we're in pain, um, but there are hidden costs for people who are in pain, have appearance issues, and are otherwise unable to seek a job because of dent the lack of dental care. Um, I support that this development in 1500 Capitol Road continue only for the dental care, the medical care, and the housing that's desperately needed and generating 60 professional positions and providing almost double the amount of care that Deontes is able to deliver right now in one of the most unmet, unseen needs in Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Good morning, um, Board of Supervisors. My name is David Brody, Executive Director of First Five Santa Cruz County. I'm here on behalf of First Five Santa Cruz County to uh, voice our strong support for this project. Um, the goals of increasing affordable housing, access to primary medical care, and access to oral health care are consistent wholly with our strategic plan. And of course, many of the plans that uh, many of you are part of with the county, including but not limited to the Thrive by Three plan, and of course, our innovative oral health access plan uh, led by Dientes. So I want to again voice First Five Santa Cruz County's strong support for this project. On a slightly more personal note, I've been empowered by my colleague at the office, Barbara Dana, to mention that her uh, mother, Joan Rodsuk, is a patient of Dientes, a 103-year-old woman blind who lives just off of Capitola Road. And they both wanted me to stand here and, and voice their support for Dientes in particular for the services that she's received and for this project and the access that it will provide for her in particular. Thank you very much. Good morning, Supervisors. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton. I'm the Executive Director of the Santa Cruz County Business Council, which represents the 85 or so largest employers here in, in our county. And I just want to say that the business community is 100% behind this project and support the development of this site. Um, we desperately need affordable housing, uh, especially housing that's going to be 100% affordable for our low-income residents right now who are being forced to commute from further and further away to our service jobs and our primary sectors of our economy. We care about our employees. We care about their families and the quality of life they have. And honestly, you couldn't get a better coalition of community partners here to meet some of our most pressing needs. Um, looking at our health metrics, I mean, I had never heard that 26% of Live Oak children are technically homeless. I mean, that's crazy. We absolutely need to build the housing. We need to work with these community partners to increase access to health care of all types. So there's no, there's essentially no reason why you should deny this project. It's a 100% it's a slam dunk. Please approve it today. Thank you. 
Hola, buenos dias. Uh, my name is uh, Alan Fisher, and um, my wife and I, we worked almost 50 years, and we saved money carefully, and we were fortunate enough to buy a small home at the end of Leela Court, opposite the uh, proposed construction project. Now, um, one of the reasons we chose our home at the end of Leela Court was because it was a very quiet street in a quiet neighborhood. Now, my commitment to social justice means that I do support this project because I know that affordable housing is, is absolutely essential as well as those other programs mentioned. However, there are a few things that we want, and we, the residents of Leela Court, will need to mitigate the negative effects on our quality of life, and that includes a very good sound wall and also a no left turn on the first entrance because cars and trucks are going to go up the, the parking lot that's proposed, and when they don't find a parking space, they're going to turn around, and we're going to hear the beep, beep, beep of the trucks backing up to turn around, and we're going to have our um, quiet disturbed. So we, I would like you to have a no left turn on the first entrance into the project. Another thing is we would like a, a strip, a small strip of green all the way down the the fence or wall because our bedrooms are so close to the proposed parking lot. Um, and also uh, under no circumstances should a throughway be created to allow people to enter Leela Court from the back end so that we would have a, a constant flow of traffic. And also, um, good, my time's up and I'm Happy to get, uh, leave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I live in rural Aptos, but I have attended the planning commission meetings regarding this project, and I want to speak for the trees. <laughs> They have no voice here. There are over 150 trees on this lot, and um, over 120 of them will be slaughtered, even at the recommendation that they be preserved by the arborist who surveyed the site. At the planning commission meeting, there were residents that showed up with pictures of the wildlife they'd seen, hawks nesting in these trees, herons. Those have no voices here. So I agree that we need affordable housing here, but we also need to preserve the character of our neighborhoods. We need to preserve what little scraps of wildlife corridor we have. I think that including the huge medical and dental is just too much for this area. What's also not being included in the staff report is the nuts and bolts. The traffic mitigation will be handled by Capitola Road being widened at some point in the future. That's not right. We also have heard nothing about the service of Metro for all these people and all of the people who will be visiting the clinics. Is it sufficient? Does Metro need to be here talking with you too? What about the Merriman House, the historic Merriman House that is the subject of the For Whom the Bell Tolls in Mr. Hemingway's book? That man grew up there. Mr. Merriman grew up there, and it is not even discussed here. It used to be on the county historic registry. It got taken off. There's no nod at all to the historic significance and the cultural significance of this person, and that this piece of property was the beginning of the Live Oak Ranchette model that is the character of Live Oak. What I want to ask is that you put in the housing, but not the medical and the dental. Make it a big community garden, keep the Merriman House, use that as an educational site for gardening, and bring a real sense of community to this area. Thank you. Members of the board, thank you very much. My name is Benjamin Eichert. I'm the director of a local nonprofit organization called Green Power. We're part of the Romero Institute. Um, and we focus on mitigating the effects of climate change. And I'm here today to say that uh, you probably know there's a strong correlation and a strong link between the availability of affordable housing and our greenhouse gas emissions for transportation. And so from that perspective, we absolutely support this project. But I also wanna ask you to go further. Um, 
we made, uh, you know, we achieved a great victory a few years ago in launching Monterey Bay Community Power. We now receive carbon-free electric energy for all of our residents and businesses. And so now we have an opportunity to electrify and decarbonize our buildings. And there's uh, a lot of important reasons to do that. First of all, um, there are more and more studies coming out that show that natural gas, which is primarily methane, is an incredibly dangerous gas for our environment. Its global warming potential is about 100 times more than CO2. And additionally, it's a combustible fuel, which is not uh, which is dangerous to have in the home. The particulate matter that comes from burning natural gas in the home can cause a range of health effects, particularly in young children who are still in the development stages. And so I wanna ask you to encourage the applicants to make every effort that they can to ensure that this project and this development is carbon free um, and that they make every effort to decarbonize the buildings and use all electric appliances. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good morning, my name is Bob Bailey. <coughs> I'm a donor. Uh, my wife Sharon and I are longtime supporters of Diantis, both annually and with the capital programs to increase the number of patients that can be served. We do this because of the great need in the community for affordable dental care and the importance of dental care. Diantis has been committed to meeting that need and teaching children the value of dental hygiene. We support the mixed use project at 1500 Capitola Road as a very significant addition to the community. We are delighted to see three groups team up to address the needs of increased access to health care and housing for the low income community. <clears throat> we know it took a great vision and thought to coordinate this mixed use development to provide for these needs. We know this project will have a big impact on the community, serving 10,000 patients, including 6,000 dental patients, providing 57 units of affordable housing, which is such a critical need, and generating 60 new jobs. We ask for your approval of the sale of the land and the entitlements to develop 1500 Capitola Road. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Kelsey Hill. I am the social media specialist and intern director for the Romero Institute, and I'm here to comment on item 16 regarding con condition of permit. Earlier this year, this board declared a climate emergency, but progress has been often slower than the crisis demands. In a time of necessary development in Santa Cruz County, we have to ensure that this growth is in accordance with our principles of environment and climate change. We have a unique opportunity at this moment in the county right now to expand building decarbonization, as my colleague mentioned before me. And we can follow the example of other states and municipalities um, and by requiring all new developments in the county to be carbon free. In the city of Santa Cruz, residential buildings make up 28% of all carbon emissions, commercial and industrial 31%. That's nearly 60% of all greenhouse gas emissions. If the county required new developments to be carbon free, our community could massively lower its emissions and also make great strides in our climate goals. All while developing services and housing that's desperately needed in the county. That's why we should take this leap and take bold action to ensure that this development is carbon free. Decarbonized buildings can often be cheaper, they can often be safer, but the big picture here is the health of our planet. We are in the beginning of a massive extinction event and we have 11 years left to, to take big strides in the climate crisis. We have, to, we have the technology and we have the need. A seaside county like Santa Cruz has no time to deliberate on the ifs and buts of climate actions. We have to make moves to lower our emissions and we have to do it now. I'm asking as a county resident, as a young person, and as a climate advocate, we can make bold decisions and we can make them now. Thank you. Now that's a good one to follow, okay. <laughs> um, Basically this time, Michael saying I'm here representing Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Uh, I sent off this uh, project to my friends there at CFST and they had a few concerns. Uh, in general, we like the project. We appreciate the, uh, the housing aspect that it's on a transit road and that kind of stuff. That's all good stuff. Uh, the first uh, concern is removing 
uh, too many century old oak trees to accommodate new building locations. Uh, we are hoping that the developer would attempt to save more of these best established oak trees. Also another concern about taking so many large trees was the loss of carbon sequestering uh, and also their emotional value and identity for the community. After all, it is the live oak community. Another concern was the replanting of the trees along the south side on Capitola Road would interfere uh, with the south facing buildings and shading uh, problems. Uh, this would limit passive solar heating. Um, another thing concerned by one of our engineers on, in our group is that there is no proposal for the taller building solar photovoltaic panel installation design. I've heard nothing about solar in this development and also nothing about an EV charging structure. You can have 192 parking spaces. I would hope there'd be some charging. Um, also, the architectural elevations and building designs uh, do not have any of this involved. As a suggestion, though, I looked at the plans. Their largest amount of parking is on the southwest side of the building area. That project could be used for solar covered parking structures, which would decrease your um, having to put it on the roofs, basically. So basically, you think this might be too ex expensive for affordable housing, but don't forget the federal credit is 22% on any commercial projects through 2020. Thank you. Uh, Tim Willoughby speaking for affordable housing now. We submitted our comments to you in writing, uh, outlining the many great reasons why this is such a good project for you to approve. Uh, I would just like to remind you that this kind of project with this level of affordability and uh, and the number of units is quite rare. And it's 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 been your help in making this happen because it doesn't happen without public land being involved in it, that kind of subsidy. And so we would like to thank you for your vote. Um, this is a great project, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and fellow uh, supervisors. My name is Cindy Valdez. I am a COPA leader in, at the Live Oak Family Resource Center, which is a nonprofit that provides services to low-income families. I would like to share a story about the fa Vasquez family. There are two parents, their two sons and spouses, and a five-year-old grandson. grandson in the family. They all share a three bedroom, one bathroom house for which they pay 3,500 3, in rent. In short, there are three small families in a very small space at a very high cost. And there are space and privacy issues with a, with a highly energetic child. And they struggle to meet the rent. This is very upsetting to me. I am very moved by the stressful situation that this family finds itself in. This is why I'm here today in support of the Midpen housing project. I believe it will be an affordable housing solution with the added benefit of providing health services. Please support this project. And COPA members, please stand. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. My name is Ken Thomas. I am a COPA leader at Peace United Church in Santa Cruz. I'm also a Live Oak resident. Uh, COPA is uh, in support of the project, both the, the housing component and the health providing um, uh, health centers. Um, what is COPA? COPA uh, is an acronym for Communities Organized for Relational Power and Action. We're a organization of civic organizations within the um, Santa Cruz County, Mo San Benito County and uh, Monterey County. There's 28 institutions. They're made up of nonprofits, schools, labor organizations, health providers uh, and faith communities. Um, the stories that we hear such as Cindy's that she just told are how we uh, go about selecting actions and areas of issues that, with COPA. The stories that we hear um, uh, time and time again have to do with the lack of affordable housing. And as you know, there is um, a linkage between the lack of that kind of uh, aff affordable housing and social uh, employment, uh, schools, education, and health uh, impacts on families. Um, 
As you know, um, vacant land within the urban service lines that is designated for um, housing uh, that are great opportunities to have uh, in, in this county. And we urge the board to um, approve this project uh, with the uh, upper end of the high density that the uh, zoning allows and um, also the health providers that are on site. Thank you. I think it just switched over to afternoon. So good afternoon, supervisors. Uh, my name is Kent Madsen. I'm a COPA leader from St. Stephen's Lutheran Church located in Live Oak. I specifically, uh, I speak in favor of the project, but I specifically wanna talk about the excellent experience we had with Midpen Housing, uh, all from planning all the way through to their ongoing management of St. Stephen's Senior Housing, our small, solution to uh, the housing issue uh, on uh, property that we made available to them. So thank you. Hello, my name is Brooke Nielsen. I'm a parent and resident of Live Oak. We love the Live Oak community. Uh, after hearing this meeting, um, my best approach is to describe my morning to you. I got up, I got my kids ready for school. Crossing 17th Avenue is a very dangerous thing to do with kids. There's a group of five of us and people don't stop at the crosswalk on Harper. Going around to the crosswalk at Capitola Road in 17th, uh, the switch to engage the, the cross setting is broken. Um, living in a place where there's no sidewalks, uh, I hope some of the funds that are allocated through this project maybe could go to resources of safety for kids getting to school. Um, and lastly, the environmental part of uh, this discussion, walking back, I uh, saw a blue heron right in the middle of the field. And I thought that was emblematic of just keeping the idea that high density is one thing, natural preservation is another. Thank you. Good afternoon, Board of Directors. For Supervisors, my name is Maria Cadenas. I represent Santa Cruz Community Ventures. We work to create local economies, and I'm here in support of the project, uh, not only for the economic impact that the jobs will be created through the clinic, but also the stability that it will provide those families. About 60% of Live Oak families are paying more than 30% in rent. On average, that's about 60% of their income. That leaves very little for food, medical care, and other things that they need in order to thrive. Families are overcrowded conditions right now. There are families that live there right now. This is about giving them housing that is livable and respectful for their family so kids can do their homework and they can have um, you know, viability in their futures. Furthermore, we've been partners as Community Ventures with all of the partners being presented here in this uh, effort. And they are all excellent partners, not only for the services that they provide, but the approach and care that they give to community. The future of this county is about working together and leveraging all the resources together. And that, this is what this project provides, not only uh, limiting the impact on climate by allowing for walking communities and having services nearby, but also ensuring that families have everything they have to thrive and move forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Coonerty Supervisors. My name is Rafael Hernandez. I'm with the Housing Program Associate of Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I'm here to speak in support of Midpens 1500 Capitola Road mixed use development, which features 57 units of affordable apartments, a community center, a public plaza, in addition to dental services office and is 100%, uh, it's 100% all electric carbon free. MBEP consists of 87 public, private, and civic entities in the counties of Santa Cruz, Monterey, and San Benito. Our housing initiative advocates for more housing of all types uh, at different income levels, a higher density in appropriate locations near transit and jobs services uh, which maximize public investment and infrastructure. This project is perfectly aligned with MBEP's housing initiative as it is 100% affordable, mixed use along a commercial corridor, walkable to schools and services, as well as having on-site healthcare. Being all electric and carbon free, 
it is a high quality project with a high threshold for energy efficiency. Uh, this carbon free approach is climate action planning that is in line with our regional goals and with Santa Cruz County's local goals. For all these reasons, we support this project and ask that you do as well. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Good afternoon, Supervisors. Manu Koenig, First District. This is a good project. It provides a lot of the things that our community so desperately needs, affordable housing, medical facilities. Uh, it's not a perfect project, but we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I fundamentally support moving forward with this project. Some things that I would do if I were in your shoes, uh, we've heard from neighbors that they're concerned about traffic impacts, and we know that traffic and parking will become a problem. We know because all you have to do is go talk to the neighbors over in the Winkle Park neighborhood about how the Emerald Bay apartments there impact parking in their neighborhood. We know that housing is in such desperate need that people will probably double and triple up in some of these affordable units, and that'll mean more cars than the site can support, and that'll lead to cars parking in adjacent neighborhoods. So we need more permit parking. And we, we know that's expensive, but we can use technology and citizen reported and enforced permit parking programs, just like they're doing in New York and Malibu today, to provide more services with less money. So we need to do things like that. And we need to update our design standards, because you heard today from the community how important it is that we preserve the natural environment that we ensure bird species continue uh, to have, to be able to call this a home as well, uh, and to protect some of the historic trees. So going forward, we need to think about projects that are win, win, win. Win for current residents, win for future residents, and win for the environment. And I hope that you'll take those elements into consideration uh, and establish policies moving forward that'll do just that. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Bueno del Bosque, District 1. Uh, I'm a local physician. I work at the Santa Cruz Health Community Centers uh, occasionally. I'm also a board member of the Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, I'm here because I uh, believe in data. And for me, uh, the, the, the oceans are 30% more acidic. Uh, there's 50% sea arctic ice uh, in the summertime, less than there used to be. Half. <laughs> Half the um, Great Barrier Reef no longer exists. Uh, um, hurricanes are more frequent and fierce to our uh, colleagues down in the Gulf Coast. We know that we have more frequent and powerful fires here in, in California, affecting now 4 million residents with the PSPSs. Um, the reason I uh, speak to this is because I'm very supportive of the project, except I would love it for it to be uh, carbon neutral, 100% uh, electrified, creating its own energy through solar, creating its own storage through battery, and creating resilience through distributed energy resources, through, for instance, microgrids. Um, I think that would set the tone for the future development. Um, Part of the problem we have today is carbon in the air. And as a physician, when I speak to patients and I talk about climate change, the cancer in the air is carbon, and we need to mitigate that. And minus a carbon negative movement through a carbon negative future through carbon sequestration, the best thing that we can do is mitigate carbon in the air. And I hope that we can create a carbon neutral clinic here. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Joseph Cherez, and I li live on Leela Court, and I'm one of the residents who's going to be highly effective about what's going on over there. Um, first of all, I wanna thank you for your time and thank you for the service to this community. I appreciate it. Um, the concern of the residents, and they asked me to speak for some of them because they have to work, they can't be here all day, is the parking. Um, the health uh, center has said they have 141 employees. The dental clinic says they have 75 employees. Health clinic says they have a potential of 60 more jobs to be done. Uh, that's 276 uh, employees that may be affected this area and this two uh, businesses. The uh, residential has um, 57 uh, residents and one parking spot for each. Some residents are three bedrooms, 
one parking spot. Some are two bedrooms, one parking spot. Some are one bedroom, one parking spot. Uh, the health center says they get 11,000 uh, patients a year. The Dunner Clinic says they get almost 42,000. You think about how many people are gonna be parking there in one day. That's quite a few. Oh, by the way, they only have 190 uh, spots that they want to give us. Um, the um, sound wall that's going to be affecting us is, is well, I'm grateful for the uh, Mid Peninsula is working with us at that, and that's appreciated. But um, I do want to also cover that the bus that they want to put in the, is at the corner of our street, which would be sticking out. It's also uh, 10 feet from a residential house, and that's bedroom of two young children. Um, I think that's, that needs to be addressed. And there's quite a few issues that need to be addressed besides the parking, the bus stop, um, the size, the three stories. There's just too many questions that are, need to be still worked on. There is no questions in my mind that affordable housing and health care for uh, the employees uh, and people of Santa Cruz County is important. I, but I don't want you to forget about the neighborhood and the people who live there. They're, we're just as important as they are. Thank you for your time. Hello again, Monica McGuire. Uh, it's so wonderful always to hear the people who stand here and tell you everything that we wish you go had the time to do yourselves. Uh, apparently you don't, because as much as there's so much good about what is being talked about here, the lack of design to take into account all of these very known factors in this very small county is pretty shocking. The, the lack of forward thinking to make sure that every per person who comes up already has what they're bringing up somewhat addressed so that we don't have to take time out of our days in the middle of a business day to come and talk to you about this. Not to mention it isn't coming to us in a way that we get to look at it and see it and understand why decisions are being made that you have to break certain laws in order to put something like this forward. Again, it is not rocket science. It is just, can you please slow yourselves down enough to listen to we the people who are doing our best to bring you our ideas long before we come to you and say, now will you just do your supervisor work of making sure that you don't let go all of these important factors. It's not that hard to account for all of these factors in the beginning stages. And you really have the authority and ability to make that happen. And we don't understand why it's not happening. We don't understand what it is in our offers to you to help that you're not taking. And when we come and then hear this many brilliant things said, and then you vote in the supermajority over and over to just go forward with something, disregarding everything that we all come up to say, it's so disheartening. It's understandable why most people say, there's no reason to go to any of those meetings. They don't listen anyway. That has been my opinion often, but I come back over and over because I care so deeply. Most of us in this county are being pushed out of living here. Most of us live with this horrible sense we're gonna be gone in five or 10 years and all these things that we have done to make it a great place will not be for us. Thank you, Monica. Please. Take our help more. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bert Whalen. I'm a resident of Lila Court. And I'd like to thank uh, the supervisors for listening to me, and especially John Leopold and Zach Friend, who we had the opportunity to meet with and discuss some of the issues. And I'd also like to thank Henry Runke from uh, uh, Runke and Post, and also uh, Cole Guntz from BKF Engineering, and Lizanna Jeffs, who helped, and also um, Elisa Tom from Public Works. We had some drainage issue things that we talked with Zach and John. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to talk to, to Mr. Coonerty and McPherson and Mr. Coquet. It's a time thing, you know, and, and these projects go on. And there are some issues, I think, with parking that everybody realizes they'll work themselves out. We have an issue as a residence about the bus, and I think that can be worked out too. Uh, I did submit a written proposal that maybe we should have the bus stop in front of the Santa Cruz Community Health Center, uh, primarily because the westbound traffic is across, and you could put an electronic 
uh, device like they have on Jose Avenue, which would slow the traffic down so people could communicate, walk back and forth. Because there's got a lot of people that are gonna take by bus, hopefully, you know. And those are some of the issues uh, that Joe Cherie's covered some of the other issues. And a lot of the residents on Lila Court are in favor. We're not against the, the project whatsoever. Uh, we had help both from John in that meeting, and I think those issues would resolve themselves. Uh, it needs to go forward. It's a good project, you know. The other issues, they'll work themselves out. They usually do. People find a way to resolve problems. And thank you very much. I appreciate listening to me today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cynthia Berger with Santa Cruz Tenants Association. I'd like to express my support for any 100% affordable unit development that comes before you. And uh, I hope that it's truly affordable. I'd uh, just like to remind everyone that renters are working really hard too, but we don't all get to buy our house even though we saved a lot of money. And um, we also are working so hard to pay 60% of our money that we can't come to supervisors meeting. So when I come here, I come here representing the thousands of people that I've talked to over the past five years. I'm sure they would really like to see more affordable housing in the county area where you have so much more space than, than the cities. Thank you. Thank you. I think that concludes public comment. I will close it and bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. Supervisor Leopold. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for the um, testimony we heard today. This, is, um, <laughs> this has been a long process. The conversations that we started uh, really in 2012 in talking about the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. And in that plan, which involved hundreds of local residents, we talked about increasing densities along our transit corridors to try to look for mixed use development. Um, and there was broad support for that. And in 2017, when, the, when uh, we began the process of trying to think what would happen at this site, this site that the county has, has not used for over 30 years, um, it, uh, we started off by uh, talking a little bit about the history of the, uh, of, of, uh, the, the site and beginning a conversation with the community uh, about what could happen at this site. And when uh, we received uh, two qualified applications, uh, we chose uh, this one to enter into exclusive negotiation. We held more meetings that were well attended, over 100 people, most of them from Live Oak. Um, and we, um, I felt as though uh, the organizations here, Mid Penn Housing and the, the clinics were listening to the community. Um, people raised concerns about the location of buildings and the, the, um, uh, what would happen on the site. And uh, I know Mid Penn met with uh, residents of Leela Court um, to address some of those concerns. And in the final meeting we had with the community, the project was actually changed. The orientation of the buildings, the location of the buildings uh, moved to respond to, to the concerns that were identified in those meetings. And uh, there, there's been a lot of work to, uh, trying to uh, meet the needs, the many needs of people in Live Oak. As we heard pretty clearly um, that um, there is a need for affordable housing in Live Oak. And at the original meeting in April of 2017, people were in favor of affordable housing. And the testimony we heard uh, from renters, from mothers, um, talking about the importance of this is powerful. And uh, it's hard, it's, it's hard to, to say no uh, to just the, 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 the simple request to have a place to live in the community that they, uh, that they live in. And so um, as we've moved forward with this project, we've also tried to take into concerns. I have met with Leela Court residents. I have talked with folks about some of the, some of the issues. Um, when I met with Leela Court residents, they were concerned about noise impacts on their property. And uh, I've talked to, with the, the developers and 
um, there seemed to be an agreement that a, uh, a precast concrete wall would actually uh, uh, do the job of meeting the needs of uh, their concerns. Uh, and I think we should include that as part of the project. I think that there was concerns about the location of the bus stop and I've initiated a, an additional conversation with our public works department and the Metro uh, to see whether that's the best spot or whether there could be another spot uh, for that. Uh, we uh, have tried to work on this question about a gate in the back of the project uh, because people walk through this project now, I mean, this property now, onto another undeveloped parcels on Harper Street and they wanna continue to do that. Uh, we have tried uh, with the folks on Linnea Court, a different street, to try to get uh, access there, including even offering to take uh, their private road. They have been unwilling. And we're trying to work with the property owner of, of, the, of the site that is undeveloped but has permitted uh, plans to see if we can work there. And I appreciate the willingness of Midpen Housing to think about the fencing and, and the trees and to make sure that if that's possible that we can actually do that. You know, the other thing that, that we talk about a lot here and was brought up today is just the environmental impact. Now there's no getting around that this has been an undeveloped plot of roughly of just under four acres for a long time. And trees were gonna be cut down in order to provide this other social benefit. Um, there will also be new trees planted. Uh, and the, the tree which residents identified as critical, the large tree at the front of the property, um, we're gonna maintain that tree. It's part of the, the identification of the site um, and it's the most significant tree on, the, on uh, the property. And I'm glad that they found a way to design this project in a way that would include that. Um, but we also care about sustainability in terms of energy, uh, carbon emissions, um, uh, uh, thinking about uh, other ways to do, uh, to create uh, housing and, and uh, businesses that have less of an impact on, on our carbon footprint. And so uh, you heard a speaker from a group called Green Power who, uh, and a doctor who's uh, on the Monterey Bay Community Power Advisory Board. And we've engaged in a conversation with the, uh, the three organizations to try to see if we can make this the first carbon neutral project in Santa Cruz County. And maybe uh, additionally build resilience uh, for this property uh, by energy storage and energy creation uh, that would really make a difference. Because what we've seen is um, even in urban areas now, power goes off. Uh, and uh, we, what we used to think was standard that we could count on flipping the switch and it being on is not really necessarily what it's gonna be like in the future. So trying to think of whether this project, we could create all those pieces of microgrid at this location. We've begun those discussions and I appreciate the willingness of everyone to continue to work on that. Um, th it should be noted that uh, there are 18 spaces for electric vehicles on, on this uh, site. Uh, and because it's on a transit corridor, uh, it's, it's, it was really helpful. I appreciate that we shared the information about the vehicle miles traveled um, and, the, um, and the, the, the reduction that we would see um, in a project like this. This is what we should expect in the future uh, projects uh, along our transit corridors where we have the availability to do that. The, the people should know also that the height standards here are the exact same one that was in our general plan 20 years ago. So we, aren't, we are finally accessing those, those heights. We, aren't, we haven't created a new height standard. You know, the, 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 the last thing that I'll say is that um, <clears throat> the historical part of this pr project and what we talked about at that first meeting is that there was an individual named Robert Merriman who lived at, uh, uh, on, on one of the houses in this uh, location. And, <clears throat> you know, so often when we talk about history in Live Oak, we talk about chicken farms. And Live Oak is way more than chicken farms. And so uh, I thought it was important that we recognize Robert Merriman because he was a local guy 
who went to college and earned a degree in economics. Um, and he came out of school during the Great Depression. And he was so concerned about the, uh, the, uh, what was happening with people in this country that he went to look for other ways, uh, uh, other economic systems, and ended up in Moscow in the early 30s. Um, it was there he studied collectivism and a lot of other ways to try to think about how we take care of people. Um, he ended up uh, going to Spain uh, as part of the large group of Americans uh, that fought uh, in the Spanish Civil War when our government and when other Western European governments chose not to get involved, but uh, the Spanish government was fighting fascism. And uh, because he had had ROTC training in, um, in, in college, he became the commander of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Uh, he eventually was captured and killed uh, by Franco's forces. Uh, but uh, before that, he met uh, Ernest, Ernest Hemingway and he included him as a character in one of his books. And so I'm glad that we're going to be recognizing that history in Santa Cruz because, uh, in Live Oak, uh, because uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot better story than just chicken farming. That we, to care about others, to fight for what you believe in, to fight fascism, um, that story hasn't gone out of style in any way. So I'm looking forward to this project. I look to forward to continuing to work with MidPen and both our clinics, uh, clinics that have been partners in our effort around the Cradle to Career Initiative, which has made a demonstrable impact on our community. Um, uh, I'm glad that this is gonna be family affordable housing um, because it's in walking distance to three elementary schools, a middle school, a boys and girls club, a swim center. This is where families need to be. And, uh, and we can't forget that. So I would like to move the, uh, the, all the recommended actions and I would like to add two pieces to it, uh, which is um, prior to the issuance of the building permits in section five that we add uh, under uh, uh, B, which is submitting the final architectural plans, <laughs> that we add one more condition that the developer shall make the building's energy self-sufficient by generating, storing, and transmitting energy from renewable sources to the extent that is feasible based on the availability of grant funding and other revenue sources, design constraints, including building code, re code requirements that point to limited use of gas, uh, where, where it might be more efficient than electricity for some equipment, and construction timeline constraints. And don't worry, Susan, I have this uh, written down for you. Uh, I'd also like to add an additional uh, direction uh, that uh, the owners of the property work on creating a precast uh, concrete fence on a portion of the Leela Court side. Uh, I've talked with uh, residents and uh, I think there's a design and a location where that would uh, work out. Uh, that's the motion. I'll second. And okay. I, just, I just wanna finish that this is a change in use. This is a change in what we've expected at this location. Um, <clears throat> but we've done it with a lot of community input. We've been thoughtful in, in, in addressing the needs that have been identified by the community. We've come up with a design that I think is good. And if we have this additional energy uh, efficiency and sustainability, we will be setting a new st uh, a standard uh, for a project in Santa Cruz County. and we can be a leader in our community, continue to be a leader in our community. So thank you for everyone being here. Mr. Red Friend. Uh, well, first off, I'd like to, I would like to thank the amount of input. This was remarkable to have this many people come forward and I appreciated the opportunity to meet with the neighbors last uh, week. And one thing that, that uh, I appreciated was they had brought forward a set of issues uh, that they were looking to be addressed and your motion fundamentally addressed most of them. And I appreciate that that comes also from MidPen's work. Um, I've worked with MidPen on projects within my own district where we've had similar concerns and they've been more than receptive and open to uh, improving projects as a result of that. This is a very unique way to look at a project, especially with the health side of it. Uh, we can't understate the importance for these communities uh, of providing those health services moving forward, <laughs> and especially being able to have it within walking distance of where so many people need these services. But I gotta say too that there were um, 
some individuals that had come forward that, that uh, usually start with, we need affordable housing, I support affordable housing, but, and then there's always this long list of reasons why you can't the uh, support the affordable housing at this or Point any other course. location. And you have to ask yourself, if not here, where? And if not now, when? And I don't know what the answers to that are. I feel like for a progressive community, we're sometimes really good at finding ways uh, to say no to affordable housing projects as opposed to finding ways to make things happen. I think that this is actually a remarkable project in that it found a very unique way to serve many needs that are needed in the Mid-County region. And I applaud my colleague for all of his work behind the scenes on, on this project. But we have to do a little bit of self-reflection on these kinds of projects. Um, we need affordable housing in some respects more than we need anything else in Santa Cruz County. We have some of the highest poverty rates, some of the highest homeless rates, and it's directly connected to our lack of affordable housing. And we need to build more projects just like this moving throughout the county, and I'd hope that more are able to come through. And I think that's part of the point of what we're doing on the Sustainable Santa Cruz Plan to do exactly this. Um, and as opposed to just trying to find the individual issues that are unique to everything about you know, traffic and noise and stuff, we'll hear that on everything. Uh, we've got to do this for the future of this community. We've got to be able to build these kinds of projects and I appreciate that this one's coming forward. Yeah, Mr. Chair, very briefly, this, this meets a tremendous need in affordable housing, especially rental housing. Uh, and it states in the report from the staff, uh, it, the project is consistent with all applicable codes and policies of the zoning ordinances, the general plan. Uh, I'm especially interested in that it meets um, the significant, it would result, not result in any significant impacts um, on air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, or water quality. And I appreciate uh, Supervisor Leopold's efforts to be consistent, be outgoing, and as he does always, uh, reaches out to the community to find out what it wants. Uh, and adding this, this uh, condition on uh, trying to get to energy self-sufficiency, I think that's a very important aspect of what we're gonna do from this day forward. And I would um, encourage any developer that's gonna come uh, in the future to have that in mind when they come before the Board of Supervisors. Uh, Midpin has been a great partner in the future and I look forward to it being a great partner in this project as well. Just make a quick comment. Uh, it's good to see the rest of the county uh, uh, building affordable housing. I mean, in the past, uh, it seemed like uh, <clears throat> the biggest burden was always on South County. And uh, I think this project is, uh, is good for the whole county. So I, uh, uh, District 2, I know, and then also the Live Oak area have been uh, building affordable housing and so is South County with Mid Penn. Uh, I'd like to see the other districts uh, participate also in the future to uh, spread it out rather than have it centralized all in one spot. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanna say this is a great project and it's been made better by the input uh, from the community. And then I also would like to say, um, you know, very often during these hearings, uh, we only hear from one part of the community. I thought today's testimony really represented a broad spectrum of the community. And I wanna appreciate the tone and tenor of everyone's remarks. Um, it was really, uh, made me proud to be, uh, to get to represent this community and to get to support a project like this. So thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, that passes unanimously. The final piece of this. <clears throat> the final piece of this project is a mere uh, $5 million from the low and moderate uh, income housing asset fund to MP Live Oak Associates LP, a partnership established by Mid Penn Housing for an affordable housing project and to approve the assumption uh, by the county of the rights and obligations of the Santa Cruz County Deve Redevelopment Successor Agency under an affordable housing uh, and property disposition agreement and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the planning director and we miss Conway uh, to bring us up to speed on this item, item number 17. Great. Good afternoon, board members. Julie Conway, housing manager. This third and final item regarding the project at 17th and Capitola Road recommends expenditure of $5 million from the low and moderate income housing asset fund. Local dollars are an essential part of building affordable housing. Without them, it is very difficult to get these badly needed projects built. 
Uh, they play a direct role in funding, of course, this $5 million, <clears throat> but they also play an absolute absolutely vital role in leveraging the rest of the money that's needed for the project. Local funds also ensure that the community has a long-term interest in the management of the community. Part of today's recommended action is the assumption of responsibilities for oversight of the property. Um, this role is consistent with all of the mid-pen projects that have happened over the last 25 years. And they have proven to be a very responsive and responsible project manager in the long term. Um, and we, we could go on. The staff report provides information overall about project and financing and the legalities. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I thought it's worth noting that the rents for these project, the proposed project will remain over time. And um, this is just a, an example. Most of the units target very low income. The rest of them target low income with the exception of the manager's unit. Um, if you take a look at the rents in this community recently, they are staggering. Um, this week, they've been reported to be an average of $2,350 for a one bedroom and $2,975 for a two bedroom apartment. So this is a significant project for the county. It concludes the disposition of property owned by the former redevelopment agency and a long community process defining the vision for Live Oak. It centers healthcare in the heart of Live Oak and provides affordable housing. And this project brings the county 16% closer to meeting our assigned uh, very low income, very regional housing need allocation. And getting to this point has been a complex process, obviously, since your board had to act as three different entities to accomplish it. I wanna take a moment to thank Supervisor Leopold for his years long determination to use this site for the benefit of Live Oak community. Um, and also to recognize the community um, and for its commitment to making this project the very best that it can be. Finally, this community is fortunate to have Midpan housing um, uh, the Santa Cruz Community Health Clinics and DeAntis Community Dental Care, helping to build a better live oak and to serve us so well. And a special thank you to MidPen for working and reworking, and maybe again reworking that vision in response to community needs, and also for the work to come to accomplish it. Thank you, and I'm gonna ask if there's any public comment on this item. Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for deliberation and action. I would move approval of the recommended actions. Motion by Leopold, second by friend. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And that passes unanimously. Quick update for folks. Uh, we, we have some folks here who have been patiently waiting for the uh, no fault evictions, which is item number 14. We will then take a break and do item uh, the SSP advisory uh, item and the legislative priorities items after the lunch break. And we will continue, I'll recommend that we continue the ordinance cleanup and the performance issues to our next, uh, uh, performance management item to our next agenda uh, going down the road. So let me get to item number 14, which is to consider an emergency ordinance adding chapter 8.47 to the Santa Cruz County Code to temporarily prohibit no fault evictions. If folks could uh, move out of the move out of the room, please, that would be great. Um, prohibit no fault evictions through December 31st, 2019 for properties that will be covered by Assembly Bill 1482, the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, as outlined in a memorandum for myself and supervisor friend. Um, very briefly, I think we all know the state took action uh, to provide more protection and, uh, and prevent uh, large rent increases uh, for tenants in California. The problem is, is that bill doesn't go into effect until uh, January 1st, 2020. And this leads this time, this gap in coverage. And we've heard news reports about some unscrupulous landlords using this op as an opportunity to evict tenants before they would be covered by this law. And um, so Supervisor Friend and I, uh, working with the county council's office, modeled on a number of other local agencies that are taking this action uh, to protect the tenants in this gap between when um, 
when uh, before the before the state law goes into effect. You want to add? I'll just briefly add that this is happening right here in our community right now. In fact, the, the, the woman who spoke to us earlier during public comment lives in my district and had shared that story. We've heard a number of other stories about this uh, going on. And these are people that are being evicted out of their homes for they're paying their rent. They're not causing any issues, but there's an incentive now in the next 60 or so days uh, to push someone out in advance of them uh, so they can raise the rent and not have to pay them a one month's rent and they can raise it more than 5% plus inflation. So this would protect people. This is during the holidays. We have to think about what, what we're doing here. I mean, we're gonna keep people in their homes that deserve to be in their homes. We just had an entire item dedicated to affordable housing. Sending people out onto the streets in this kind of housing market is not a solution for addressing anything that's to the interest of the county. And this just adds uh, 60 days and accelerates that process that the state's already codified uh, locally. And finally, I guess I'd say uh, we are asking this is be passed as an urgency ordinance, which requires a four fifths vote in order that it goes into effect today um, and not require the readings in the 30 day uh, implementation period. Uh, just a quick question, maybe for council is if someone's in has been given an eviction notice and we pass this, will this cover them? Yes, it okay. goes backwards. Uh, if, if, you, if you look at the applicability section of the ordinance, if you're still in your notice period and you're still living in the unit and it hasn't passed yet, this covers you. Okay, thank you. Great, now it's an opportunity for members of the public to speak to us. So is there anyone who'd like to speak to us on this item? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Gretchen Regenhardt. I'm with California Rural Legal Assistance. We provide free legal services for low income people in our community and our primary focus here is housing because it has to be. Um, I'm so uh, thankful that you've brought this measure forward and I, I really wanna send out initially my appreciation for that. Uh, since AB 1482 passed, we've seen uh, clients initially coming in with notices of huge rent increases. And then I think once the, the state law passed and landlords realized that they wouldn't be able to continue those increases after the first of the year, now they're terminating those tenancies. We have people coming in who've lived in their units for 24 years, 19 years, people with disabilities, people with kids, people with high risk pregnancies, where their entire complex, everyone in the complex is being evicted so that the landlord can raise the rent in January, which the landlord would not be able to do because the rents would otherwise roll back to um, March 2019 levels. So um, passing this ordinance today will help um, countless people who uh, don't deserve this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jim Willoughby, Affordable Housing Now. Uh, this is a sensible solution to a real problem. Uh, and we're glad that you can get it done and get it done today. Thank you. Does anyone else would like to speak to us? Seeing no one, I'll close public, public comment and bring it back to the board. So motion by friend, second by McPherson. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 That passes unanimously uh, per the urgency uh, requirements. So we will now take a, uh, let's come back at uh, 1.45 uh, and we will hear items uh, 10 and 13 um, and continue items 11 and 12 uh, to the next regular scheduled Board of Supervisors meeting. going to reconvene uh, for our November 15th. Uh, the first item we have up is item number 10, which is to consider an ordinance adding chapter 2.125 to the Santa Cruz County Code to create a syringe services program advisory commission uh, as amended as amended for an administrative clarification on October 22nd, uh, 2019 and schedule the ordinance for a second reading and final adoption on November 19, 2019 as outlined in a memorandum of the Director of Health Services. Ms. Hall. 
Good afternoon, Chair Coonerty, honorable members of the board. Um, I also have with me here our uh, relatively <coughs> new health officer, Dr. Gail Newell. And uh, as our health officer, she also has statutory authority over public health matters, as well as the public health department. Um, <clears throat> so for background on, on this item, we came to you on October 22nd with um, draft ordinance language regarding forming a syringe services uh, commission. And this was a result of a biannual report that the department had provided to the board in June of 2019. As a result of that biannual report, the board provided some direction for the department to return with a number of items and the formation of this commission was one of them. As many of you may know, um, until this time we've had, uh, because the county took over this program that was formerly one that was run by a community nonprofit, at the time that the county transitioned into these services, we developed uh, an informal advisory board. And um, when the board formally adopts this ordinance, we'll make the transition of uh, transitioning out of the advisory board into a formal commission that is Brown acted. On October 22nd, we provided draft language to the board and the board had one minor uh, change to um, clarify language and you can see the strikeout version in your um, board backup documentation. And uh, at this time, we, pr we present to you the changes that were recommended and directed on uh, October 22nd for the board's consideration. If the board should approve the ordinance language today, we will come back with a final ordinance and for adoption of, uh, for board approval of adoption. Great. Uh, are there any questions? Are there any comments from members of the public? Seeing none, I'll bring it. You'll go ahead. Back to the board for action. Yeah, I just um, yeah, I'd, um, recommend the, the, the I would uh, move the recommended action and I'm glad we're sitting up the syringe services commission. I just wanted to restate my belief and, and I really appreciate every, this is a very complicated, very um, controversial subject in some circles, um, but I just want to restate my belief that uh, reducing the harm to the community by mitigating the needle litter is as, important, is as important as reducing the harm and the spread of communicable diseases. Um, they're not mutually exclusive goals. Um, and I know the health services department has really been working hard at this and I appreciate their efforts, but um, uh, I look forward to the, recommend, uh, the recommendations coming on December 10th. Great. So did you, you move I'll the recommended the, action? Yes, I'll move the recommended action. Second. second, motion by McPherson, second by Friend. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, yes, uh, I'm supportive of uh, the action that we're taking here. Uh, and um, I would point out that just this week, uh, the Washington Post did a story about a new HIV cluster in West Virginia. Um, uh, when a community that dealing w w has been dealing with some of the same issues that we're dealing with here, and they chose to reduce services and what they received in, in response was a, a great new HIV uh, infection cluster. So it's, it was, it's a cautionary tale. This has happened in lots of other places in West Virginia and Ohio and New York and Vermont. And so we wanna make sure that we have a strong enough program that we don't see that happen here in our community. All right, we have a motion and we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, that passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for your support. Um, we could do item number 11, but I've been uh, advised by council that since I announced that we've put it off to the next meeting, uh, we'll be putting off uh, item 11 and 12, and we'll go with item number 13 as our final item today, which is to consider the 2020 legislative priorities for Santa Cruz County and take related actions as outlined in a memorandum of the CIO. So good afternoon, Chair Coonerty and members of the board. Um, I'm an assistant CAO, Nicole Coburn, and I'm here with Jason Hoppin. As you know, he serves as our county communications manager, and he also manages our legislative program. <coughs> so he is going to be walking you through this item, which addresses our 2020 legislative priorities. Good afternoon, members of the board. <coughs> Each year, the county, like other counties throughout California, puts together a legislative program. Each county does this differently, and in Santa Cruz County, staff have traditionally prepared a legislative agenda based on feedback from departments and their professional associations on matters of legislative importance in the upcoming state and federal legislative years. 
Today, we'll, we will be presenting our legislative program and asking for a specific direction on two items. While we have made changes to how we handled this program over the years, we have always presented the board and our legislative delegation with a legislative packet of items that departments have flagged. Collectively, this represents a statement of our values as a community. This year, we present the 2020 version of the packet with more than 100 specific items to monitor, including specific bills and general topic areas. This prospectus is being submitted for your information, and if our advocates in Sacramento or staff request specific support or opposition, we would return to you for action at that time. New this year is the list of legislative priorities. We are presenting four state and four federal priorities in a mix of topic areas. Some of those are issues you and the public are quite familiar with, some are new. Should you adopt these eight priorities, we would ask that you schedule a December 2nd public meeting with our legislative delegation to discuss them. These are matters on which the county expects to be proactive in seeking either administrative or legislative remedies, and we would expect to work with our delegation advocates and professional associations in order to accomplish them. I will briefly run through these items now, which are included in your packet. So the four state legislative priorities, um, what you see on your screen is shorthand, but I will read them the full uh, item for your benefit. So the first item has to do with the opioid crisis, which impacts communities across the US, including Santa Cruz County. And it is uh, that the county supports funding for drug medical services and access to substance use disorder services, including medication for addiction treatment and withdrawal management. The second item has to do with uh, an area that we are a leader in solid waste and recycling. And it is that the county supports new legislation to address growing plastic pollution, declining global markets for recycled materials, compliance standards, CRV, and other issues, including funding uh, mandated local organics diversion facilities through cap and trade revenues. We believe there are some extra revenues because the governor has withdrawn support for a couple items that cap and trade revenues were being used for previously. The next item is that the county supports reimbursement for counties and other local governments associated with the costs of public safety power shutoffs, including but not limited to preparation outreach services for medically vulnerable adults, shelters and more, as well as increased local government input on investor owned utilities, wildfire management plans and practices. And obviously we have some recent experience with that. The county, uh, the fourth item is that the county supports legislation making state armories available to address homelessness throughout California, including making them available year round, reducing or eliminating fees, standardizing security processes to minimize cost to local jurisdictions and more. We will now turn to the federal legislative priorities. <clears throat> Several of these you will be familiar with as well. Uh, the first has to do with our road repairs and that's that the county supports restoring flexibility and funding either through administrative or legislative action of local governments to complete emergency repairs funded by a federal highway administration, FEMA or other agencies through time extensions or legislation expanding project windows on projects using federal emergency relief funds. The next item has to do with a project that we've been working on for quite some time. And it is that the county supports the US Army Corps of Engineers and the White House Office of Management and Budget reestablishing funding formulas for more equitable to more equitably determine the costs and benefits of flood control projects <laughs> in communities such as the Pajaro Valley, which has inadequate flood control protections due to project analysis favoring wealthy communities. The next item uh, has to do with uh, housing actually, and we believe that housing is a big hole in a lot of our programs, uh, including um, whole person care and uh, various services offered through our uh, health services and, and uh, other agencies. And it's that the county supports future changes to the California Medicaid state plan amendment or new federal waivers to allow housing to be included in the reimbursable scope of services for beneficiaries with complex health challenges. And the last item has to do with parks. And it's that the county supports permanent funding for the land and water conservation fund, including SB 1081 and HR 3195. And that the county also supports federal funding for active transportation, particularly for hiking and biking trails. And with that, we would ask that you adopt the recommendations in the packet, including scheduling the December 2nd board meeting so that we can discuss these items in depth with our delegation. Are there any questions? Great, any questions? I have a brief comment, but go ahead. 
Well, there was one item on, on the more detailed list uh, that I just wanted to, the sure. wording seemed a little strange to me. It was uh, in the health services access to health care. It was the last bullet and it says actions by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Congress or legislature to deny, reduce, cap or eliminate MA TCM reimbursement or to make claiming more administratively burdensome. It's, it seems like it's missing what we, we don't want that to happen or, you know, it's, it just seems like it could use a few more words, right? I, we don't want them to deny, reduce, right. eliminate. And it's, it's not clear from the way that's written. We can take a look at that, what that correct the language. If, correct if the language. I just, when I read it, I was like, well, no, we're, we, we don't want to cut my funding, so. No, we don't. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so great work on this. I think it's both focused and then also um, well-structured to make clear to our, what our legislative priorities are. I guess the one, uh, two changes I'd suggest making is on the, on the actual legislative priorities for the, the one about power safety shutoffs. I was in the last sentence says, as well as increase local government input on investor owned utilities, wildfire management and practices. I'd also include governance and structure um, because I think, I think we're seeing some fundamental problems uh, with with a, an investor-owned utility. Okay. Um, and the other thing, the other uh, change I'd like, if my colleagues agree, is on the bottom of page seven of the longer list, uh, we have uh, a goal that policies and actions to limit university, limit enrollment at UCSE to match community resources and to fully mitigate community impacts of any future growth, including providing infrastructure needed for gr that growth and support. Um, it would be great to move that up to the legislative priority list because it's such a fundamental issue to this county and we will need our legislators um, support to add that to the state list. I support it even if it ruins the symmetry of the uh, <laughs> state and federal. Okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, this is, uh, I really want to uh, say how much I appreciate your efforts in getting these priorities. As you say, there's more than 100 of them and we have now maybe, maybe the nine top, not even the top 10, but uh, we, we really got to focus on what's most important. And a particular interest of interest to me is the recycling situation and fixing that and uh, making sure that um, our lower, lower local jurisdictions are reimbursed on the power shutoffs um, and fixing the federal transportation fund. But there's one though that I'd like to get um, making the state armories available year round for emergency shelter. I, I think I, I would like to see how we can make that um, a uh, little more um, additional direction to strengthen that language. Um, it says to improved, uh, you know, to prove our access to it, I, to allow access to armories or strengthen it. So um, it gives us a little more oomph in trying to do that. It might be changed in the legislative process, but um, I'd like to just say uh, improve instead of improved uh, because they, I don't know how much they would improve it, just allow it and let it happen. That's just a suggestion or some, some language of that type to uh, put more emphasis on the need. Because we've uh, seen that uh, we have an armory here that's been closed and um, uh, this past, this uh, was empty last winter and we don't have an agreement with the state to use it this winter and the rains are approaching. So I'd just like to see us kind of press um, the envelope on that. Yeah, it's been, I think, at least three years since we've been able yeah. to use that, maybe yeah. four. Sure, and that item is actually based on um, a bill that was introduced last year in the legislature and did not move forward that would make armories available year round for uh, homeless shelters. It has previously been available during the winter months, so that is what, that's where we get the language about expanding access. The last few winters it has not been available because of a project that the Armory is working on. Um, but we expect that will be returned soon and we would just like to open that up for the whole year, but we can definitely look at the language. I'll just add just one last thing. The, the uh, piece where we talk about uh, climate change and infrastructure and uh, acknowledging that we need help from both our state and federal partners uh, to help pay for the infrastructure necessary to, to, uh, to adapt to the climate change changes that are happening um, is gonna become critical and other states have this and I hope when we have our uh, legislative delegation here that 
we'll be able to talk with them about it because when we have things like cap and trade and it should be used not to not to you know basically support the, the polluters but uh, figure out a way to help the communities who are dealing with the impact of these carbon emissions um, to be able to to respond and we're going to need a lot of support uh, as we get this climate action management manager that will look at adaptation strategies we're going to identify a lot of needs so I appreciate you putting it in there. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, is there any member of the public who likes to speak to us about these items? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board for action. Second. As amended. Okay, motion by McPherson, second by Leopold. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, thank you for your good work on this and hopefully our legislators listen. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so that will, um, we will now conclude our uh, meeting and uh, adjourn to the next regularly scheduled board supervisors meeting, which is uh, November 19th here at 9 a.m. here in board chambers. <laughs>